name is Arn Kislenko. I'm a historian. My specialty is the 20th century, but I've come here to Jerusalem because I want to find out what life was like in the first century. Look at this. A job that's still here after 2,000 years. Money changer. In this famous scene from the Gospels, Jesus sees the money changers in the temple. He overturns their tables and drives them out of the temple. Everybody's always been interested in the commotion Jesus caused. But I want to know what all these people were doing at the temple that day and what they all did for a living. What were their jobs like? And what drove the economy? The hillsides around the city of Nazareth contain ruins that date back to biblical times. They've helped archaeologists and biblical scholars recreate what Nazareth would have looked like in Jesus' time. James Tabor, a biblical scholar specializing in the life of Jesus, is here to show me just how real it is. But listen, James, was, and was Nazareth really like this? I don't even think it could be reproduced, no matter what you did. Think yeah. about the crowdedness, the smells, the cacophony of sounds. The animals. Animals walking around, the dung in the street. I was the, thinking it must have stunk. It would have to. We're going to go into one of the houses here. Notice as we step inside through the door, we're actually outside in this courtyard area, this workshop area. 90% of the life is outdoors, even though you're in the house with a bit of shelter from the sun. Think of all of these activities that go on in a village, uh, particularly the manufacturing, like somebody's going to be making the pottery, somebody's going to be baking the bread. Or Everybody does that out of their the house. Out of their house. So it really gives you a sense of, of that workshop atmosphere. Right. And here's an example of the weaving. After shearing the sheep and washing the wool, the weaver does what's called carting the wool, opening it up and separating the fibers so they can work them on the loom. That's been cleaned and worked on. How long does it take you to clean the wool? Like uh, three, months. three or four months. Wow. And... Can I try that? Yes. All right. Yeah. So I'm holding it like yes. that? Yes. And, you roll it. And spinning it. Yes, and move your fingers with it. You only need to control your fingers with the spindle. Okay. Yes, that's it. Yeah, it's easy for you move, to move, say. Move, move, move. Move, move your fingers. That's it. Do you work and forth. Yeah. Yes. Like that? Yes. OK, uh, I'll just let you do that. So everything's done here. Do yes. you dye the wool here yeah. as well? We're dyeing the wool, we're carding the wool, we're spinning here, and after that, we take to the loom to make fabrics. But it's take a long, long, long process. But there's another job they're doing in this house that I want to see, because it's one of the most famous jobs in the Bible, carpentry. We've all been told that when Jesus wasn't overturning tables, he was making them. Now, some carpenter's tools haven't changed in 2,000 years, but some have. What's, uh, what's this tool for? It's a drill. A drill. It's nothing like my drill. Well, how do you use it? Can I try? It's really tricky. Now I know where they invented power tools. Yeah. This is hard. Is it common to have a, a small child in the workplace? Like Absolutely. This? Judaism taught that uh, if you don't train your son in a profession, you've uh, abandoned him, basically. We're in a carpentry shop, most famous job in the world. I mean, is this how Jesus would have grown up? Yeah, I think that's the image people have. It's certainly in the movies and the books. We've been studying. Uh, the terms that are used, and Jesus is called a carpenter in English, but right. of course it wasn't written in English, written in Greek. Right. But the word actually is tekton, which means, and it means sort of artisan or a builder, like a stonemason, which really doesn't fit woodworking as much. Right. So it could be any kind of builder. You notice there's not a lot of wood in a home, right. but more stone. Lots of stone. And most of the examples when Jesus taught, he talks about stone so often. So it's Jesus the stonemason. Not Jesus the that carpenter. really does seem to be the best interpretation of, really? of the original text. I mean, that's totally different than everything else we've ever been told before. Yeah, I think the carpenter idea is romantic in a certain way. A better image is getting up at 3 in the morning and heading off 
to Sephras nearby for hard labor uh, at four or five in the morning, right. coming back near dark. Stone was the most important building material in biblical times and easy to get from the rocky terrain. So Jesus the stonemason may have worked right here. 2,000 years later, builders in Israel and around the world have hand-operated gantry cranes and water-cooled sawing machines. The modern builders here still use the local limestone. Building techniques might have changed, but the ancient skills are alive. For some buildings, the shaping and cutting of stone is still done by hand. So hot on the trail of the job that Jesus may have actually done, I'm heading off to the nearby town of Sepphoris. Because it's here, only three miles, but a world away from the village where he grew up, that Jesus may have gotten his first taste of the occupying power of Rome. This is James Strange, a world-renowned authority on biblical archaeology. He's been excavating Sepphoris for nearly 30 years, so he'll know why stonemasons in nearby Nazareth could have worked here in Jesus' time. All the houses and buildings that you see over here to the left, that's Nazareth. Right there. That's right. This is the economic center. So everybody from 18 miles around can come into this city and buy and sell. All the villagers, all the little hamlets, independent farmsteads, whatever they are. But also this city is in a major trade route that extends all the way to Italy and all the way to Egypt. So it's a trade hub. Yeah, very much so. Would Jesus have come here? When Herod the Great dies, this city revolts and the Romans respond by destroying it. Then Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas, inherits the city, so he gives orders that it be rebuilt. So thousands of workmen have to come in here. Someone has to cut the millions of stones that are in this mosaic floor. Jesus very well could have come and worked here. Jesus, his father, his brothers could all have been here. That's incredible. In Jesus' time, the Roman Empire ruled over Judea. Pagan Roman life, with its many gods and liberal ideas, was very different from how the Jewish people lived and how they prayed to one God. So the young Jesus lived right at the intersection of traditional Jewish culture and the urban life of the occupying Romans. He wasn't raised to live as the Romans did, but he may have built their houses, huge houses. Here's what remains of one of them. I mean, look at our feet. I think it's the biggest threshold in the state of Israel, and it's the most finely cut. So I'm thinking a, a bureaucrat. Some kind of bureaucrat. In fact, I would guess we're looking at a magistrate. Right. <clears throat> we come into the opulence of, That's right. of his office, I presume. <laughs> there was a pool right over here. That's a pool. That's a pool. There was another pool over here. So we had two Roman pools inside this building. This is astonishingly big and Roman. Even the administrators would be local people in the higher Rome. So they get co-opted into the, into the occupying. That's right. right, that's right. So the Romans didn't just occupy, they influenced many of the Jewish people. Many of them were Hellenized or Romanized, absorbing Greek and Roman culture right here in the busy city of Sepphoris. So what was it like here? It's the main road. It's absolutely teeming with life, people going everywhere. Uh, they're buying, they're selling, they're manufacturing. There'll be a laundry you can go in there. Uh, this will be selling spices, and it'll be very aromatic. It must have really smelled. It, it... Oh, yeah. You bet it did. Think about a fresh fish shop, and you're walking right by it, you know, with all this fish, and the sun's been on a little while. And then also, there are two drains underneath us, on either side of the street, actually, and all kinds of sewage is running through there. <laughs> so we're smelling fish, we're f smelling sewage, we're f smelling cinnamon, we're smelling perfume, we're smelling people. Depending on the prevailing winds, for example, you could be coming in from Tiberias and you could actually smell this city before you saw it. The ancients speak of that. Now, I wanted to ask you, though, you know, I'm always fascinated by these little things. So, you know, what are the people wearing and what are they, how do they keep clean in a place like this? Well, if they're wearing white, like they're a high-ranking person, then it has to be washed in urine. That's the Roman technology. <laughs> so it stinks. It, it stinks. It's noisy. It's uh, energetic. There's a lot of things going on. So it's the Fifth Avenue of the ancient. It's something like that, a Fifth Avenue in a major city right in the ancient world. 
The Gospels tell us that when commerce threatened to take over the life of the temple, Jesus cracked the whip. And the seeds for that rage could have been sown here at Sepphoris, where Jesus was likely getting his hands dirty while trying to keep his soul clean. Jesus' job leads him to where the work is, and his ideas and philosophy begin to develop with huge consequences. This is how every day began in first century villages with women making bread before dawn. In the time of the Bible, the men went out early to work in the fields, but the women were up first, making a meal for them to take along. When it came to biblical jobs, women literally kept the home fires burning. If you didn't want to use sticks to create friction and heat, and if you didn't have a flint to create a spark, you kept the fire going at all times to heat your home and cook your meals. Food historian Tova Dickstein is an expert in the foods of ancient Israel. She's helping me to prepare your basic year one meal. I can't wait to see how it tastes. Is it healthy? I mean... Yeah, this is very healthy. Why? Because it's a complete nutrition. This is whole wheat. Right. Whole wheat with lentil. It's a complete protein. It's like meat. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. So the wheat and the lentils together make up your protein. Protein. And here right. you have calcium. They pick up the fig because they knew. I don't know how they know it, but you get the calcium from the figs. So these are the basic, basic, the basic food groups. Food. Exactly. It's so simple. It is That's very the simple. beauty of it. Yeah. yeah. If we were living in biblical times, would this be all we'd ever eat? No, this is the very basic ingredients, but people had more, like uh, vegetables, garden vegetables, fruit, olive. Now this smells amazing, it really does. And I'm not saying that because I helped to make it. So we use the bread as a, as a scoop. As a, as a spoon. We would have had bread every meal in yeah. biblical times, right? Yeah, bread was the staple food. Every meal, there, there were uh, poor people that this was the main dish. Bread was between 50 and 70% of the meal. Really? Yeah, 70%. Of every meal? Almost every meal which is probably why the Gospel of Matthew contains a phrase that many of us know. Give us this day our daily bread. Tova, this is far better than I thought it would be. This is absolutely delicious. This diet provided all the nutrition you would need for a hard day of work in the fields. Many of the jobs here were connected to the land. On the day the Gospels tell us Jesus overturned the money changers table, some of the people in the temple were likely farmers. They would have come here to bring their first crops as an offering of thanks. With your life dependent on your crops and animals, you figure everyone would try and get along. But the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve had two sons. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. And we know how that turned out. Ronit Meoz is an expert in ancient Israeli studies and she can tell us what agricultural jobs around here were like. A farmer, of course, would look at the shepherd as something very, very low, but I think the shepherd would look at the farmer as being a prisoner because he's tied to his land. So do you mean that farmers and, and shepherds would compete? Are not friends, especially if you have those goats. Beyond their use as food, in biblical times, goats were also used for temple sacrifices. These money changers that Jesus will confront are converting foreign currency. And one of the reasons pilgrims needed the local currency is so that they could buy animals to sacrifice in the temple. But before they meet their fate as lunch or sacrifice, goats have their own ideas. If she wants uh, to eat from a tree, she will climb or as much as she can and she will take the leaves. She will also take out the roots, something that the sheep cannot do. So for a farmer, she's really, she's a destroyer. Maybe that's why the farmer Cain and the shepherd Abel didn't get along. Abel's livestock really got Cain's goat. And the sheep were useful not just for food, but for making clothes. But first, you had to catch them. 
Would you like to lead this flock? Uh, Would you like to do that? Sure, let's give it a try. Okay. I can do that. Oi. Let's go. I think you forgot one. <laughs> oh, yes. Did you see that? Champion Shepherd. Is it terrible that I'm thinking lamb kebabs right about now? For the biblical farmer, the most important task was growing enough food for his family. Animals provided crucial help plowing the fields and growing staple foods. No wonder the Bible mentions animals so often. They were life and lifeline. Your mule, your cow, whatever animal you had is really your friend. She knows you. The most important thing in my world. She is, yeah. yes. Because yes. everything depends on her. Yes. But in the Bible, isn't there a reference to plowing a straight line? Jesus says to his followers, if you follow me, do it like you are plowing in the field. Just go straight after me. Don't look right, don't look to the left. Yeah. And that's okay. not easily done. All right. Yes. Yeah. Now the left one. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. I think she's more interested in eating than in plowing. Start though. going. You know, it's a lot easier to say that <laughs> than know, to do that. Dia. Dia. Wrong dia. Wrong dia. Very good. Dia. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, 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 I'm doing it. Well, from morning to night, I'd from be out here tonight, plowing. morning to night, you'd be plowing now. It's really a lot of work. I'm sweating now. But you know that God said to Adam that with the sweat of your brow, you will get bread out of the land. Yeah. There we go. That's a girl. Biblical farmers developed a terracing system still in use here. Yeah. They cut large shells out of the hillside to prevent the soil from washing away. Here they grew barley and wheat and anxiously hoped they'd chosen the right amount of seeds to eat and to sow. So that's the actual barley? Just the seedlings, yeah. It's very important that they get settled now in the ground and that they grow and they get roots. So what's the worst thing that could happen as a farmer in biblical times? No rain. The so worst. Nothing grows? This is going to be bread. So if there is no bread, there is no life here. From the time of the Bible right up to today, for the Jewish people, unless you've broken bread, you haven't had a meal. And in the holy temple, beyond the courtyard where the sacrifices were held, was the sanctuary. And the only food allowed in there was bread. But to grow the grains needed for your bread, you needed water. Being a biblical farmer meant looking to the skies and praying there would be enough rain. One of the toughest jobs was hauling water. And guess who did that? Actually, you are now doing a typical woman's job, you know? This is a woman's work. Very hard work. Of course, very important. One of the hardest will be, be given either to the women or to slaves. Or university professors. To... <laughs> By the way, you know that it was a very hard job, but this is also the place of encounters. Women found their spouses. Really? Yes. The most important encounters happened by a well or a cistern. So this is like all the, the important marriages. This is the first century hangout. This is the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yes. First century Facebook. Of course, that's a matchmaking place here. At the well, chance encounters led to many important biblical marriages: Moses and Zipporah, Jacob and Rachel, Isaac and Rebecca. Now this place is not as well suited to matchmaking but it's just as important for collecting water. Ancient engineers designed this wooden treadmill connected to a ring of clay pots called a sequia. Now, how it works is that you walk or run on this part of the wheel, and if you're doing it right, the wheel spins, and those jugs up on top scoop up water from this pond and then drop them into that sluice at the top and then the sluice runs into a trough behind me where people would pick up the water for farming and drinking and so on. But you gotta keep going on this because the momentum really drops off quickly. So these are the jobs that would have surrounded Jesus when he was growing up. But many of his followers, the disciples, held a different profession, one we haven't seen so far. I want to find out why so many of them were in this profession, and I want to try and do this job. I'm in Israel, learning about jobs in the time of Jesus. 
And there's a pretty important job you can't miss if you read the New Testament, because at least four of the disciples of Jesus were fishermen. So I've come north to the Sea of Galilee to find out why. This is Chaim Weitzman, a second generation fisherman who grew up right here on the shores of the Galilee. We're gonna fish where the disciples fished and maybe find out the connection between this job and Jesus' earliest followers. Chaim, we gotta get a cover for your boat. A little roof going. Yeah. Splash guard. That's a hat. <laughs> oh, I love that. Now I'm a fisherman. Yes. yes looks good. Yeah, very good. So how did the disciples know where to find the fish? Like Chaim, they knew the waters around here, and they used their instincts. They didn't know his work, but they had Jesus. And the Gospels tell us he miraculously knew where to find the fish. We have sonar. We're fishing for tilapia, which has been swimming in these waters since before the time of the disciples. Now, they call it St. Peter's fish, named after, guess who? Very good. Fish, fish. Hey. Yo -ho -ho. Hey, look. Ah. Hey. <laughs> yes. What is he? Oh, good. My first fish in a net. Look at that. This is bigger, but mine's tougher. How many fish do we norm do you catch every it's day? It's one, 100 kilo. 100 kilo. 100 kilo, yeah. In one one net. W one net, yeah. Well, I caught slightly less than that. And I'm going to cook them up biblical style. This is Barrett Gross, who manages Dex restaurant here in the Galilee. She's going to show me how it's done. Me and Ata will be happy to teach you. Great. Hi, Ata. All right. You take the fish. You stick it through? Stick I, it through. <laughs> I believe that's the technical term. OK. Great job. Better than Ata. You see, the teacher became the pupil. This is a special type of uh, oregano. It's called viso. Mm. Like that? Yeah. This is hot. The whole thing. And if you want to check if the fish is ready, yeah. you take the stick of the oregano. OK. And you try to, you know. So this is my ancient fish thermometer. Yeah. If it goes through, it's ready. Hi, Jim. Hello there, Ari. How are you? All right. Look at that. Oh, I'm impressed. Ah, uh, wait a second. A little biblical uh, garnish here for you. A little as well. biblical garnish. Well, very nice indeed. While Jim enjoys my expertly caught and brilliantly cooked St. Peter's fish, I ask him about the biblical fishing business. First of all, you fish with nets. That's mm. that's what's economical if you're trying to do something commercial. And then when you fish with nets in the ancient world, you fish at night because the fish can't see the nets at night. In order to keep your clothes from being ruined by the wash and bringing in nets and so on, you usually fish naked. <laughs> <laughs> the TV viewers will be glad that I, I, I didn't try that experiment. That, uh, that's a little too much. These people, I mean, fishing in ancient times around here, they, are they are they poor? Oh, not at all. This is the most stable industry for this area. According to the writings of the first century eyewitness Josephus, the Galilee had a thriving economy with a salting factory to preserve fish for export. And with some of the catch, they made fish sauce, which was called garum. I'm meeting biblical food historian Susan Weingarten to learn how to do this fragrant job. We're going to cut these fish up, put them into the pot together with salt. The guts of the fish have enzymes in them. The enzymes will break down the flesh of the fish. The salt will prevent it from producing all sorts of harmful bacteria. And we leave it around for three months. Any kind of fish, right? <laughs> Any kind of fish. Everything goes in. Always a bit of salt in the middle. Now, what was garum used for? The top quality garum <laughs> was used as a condiment, as a flavouring, as rather you would use soy sauce nowadays. The lower quality ones was the sort of thing that you dip your bread into, perhaps. Right. And at the bottom, there's a sludge, which they used to eat. The sludge would contain the bones, mm. uh, which don't get digested by the enzymes. And it's these bones that we find archaeologically, and we can identify that this was a place where they made garum. Whose job would this have been? 
Other than mine. <laughs> Other than yours, right. <laughs> they, they would be made in factories. We found the remains of garum factories all around the Mediterranean. So this would have been a, a commodity. A commodity that was traded widely over the Mediterranean. King Herod imported garum from Spain. Spanish garum was the best. <clears throat> They've even found garum in Masada. Would this have been considered to be a, a, a good job as a garum maker? Or? A person working in the garum factory, I, I guess not, but a person that made all his money out of, the, out of owning the factory. I can't imagine this was a glamorous job. A glamorous, so. I can't imagine it either. So how long has this garum Let's been get, sitting? This garum's been sitting here for a month and a half, and this one for a bit over two months. Beautiful. Yeah, let's have a go. <laughs> Look, you can see the fish, the way they're all decaying. This is absolutely revolting. It wouldn't smell nearly so bad at the end of the process. This has to rank as maybe one of the worst jobs I would ever have to do. We didn't make you eat it, did we? No, and, and I'm really grateful that you didn't. So there are lots of fish in the sea, the Sea of Galilee, which could be sold, salted, and made into fish sauce for export. This was a good business. And in the nearby fishing village of Bethsaida, where many of the disciples came from, there's more evidence of how profitable the job fishing could be. Bethsaida is right on a major international trade route, the Via Maris. You've heard of the road to Damascus? Well, it starts down in Egypt, and goes right through here. This is the site of Bethsaida. It's a major city in Jesus' lifetime. The image in my head of poor fishermen gets dispelled in Bethsaida, where archaeologists have discovered evidence of a middle-class lifestyle. How do you know these were houses of the fishermen? Well, because um, weights from, for fishing nets have been found here. Um, they have actually found the the bones of fish here. This is the courtyard of the house of the fishermen. And this is the wine cellar. It's a wine cellar. And this is what we need to find out if they're wealthy or not. Because all the houses look the same on the outside. It's what's on the inside that tells us their level of wealth. They found tall jars of the type that are used for wine. If they're collecting wine and going to a lot of trouble to corbel this over, and to make a cool place, then they're, they're trying to preserve a collection of wine. Pretty wine. Yeah, yeah. You can store quite a lot then. Yes, yeah. so you don't express your wealth by decorating the house on the outside. You accumulate things on the inside that indicate your wealth. What would this tell you about the life of fishermen around here? Well, it tells us that they can accumulate a lot of capital, that they're really rather well off. The disciples, they weren't poor. They're fishermen. They might be fishermen contractors. You know, they might have a lot of boats out there, and they might be doing very well. And they were better off than other tradespeople, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some of them lived here. Yeah, some of them actually lived here. Came from Bethsaida. It's Peter and Andrew, particularly. <laughs> right in this neck of the woods, isn't it? Yeah, we could be looking at their houses and not knowing it. You know, it makes sense that the disciples would have had well-paying jobs, because the Jesus movement is a rebellion, a revolution, and that takes cash as well as belief. We're seeing a transition between the Old Testament and the New, and jobs are one of the key differences. In the South, the farmers and shepherds of the Bible are at the mercy of the rain and the seasons. But in the North, the New Testament stories are all about fishing, a year-round and stable business. All right. We've seen the nice guys in the nature. Who isn't happy to meet a farmer or a fisherman? They provide food. But there were guys who did another kind of job in Jesus' time, and everyone hated them. No one was happy to see them show up. And yet, it's a job that one of Jesus' own disciples did. In the first century, the Roman Empire ruled over Judea. But not only were the people colonized, they had to pay taxes to Rome. And what did the Romans do with all the money? Some of it went in to build places like this. I'm here in the ancient city of Bet-Shean, and all I can say is, wow, this 
place is incredible. It is beautiful. It's massive. And I'm thinking that at its height, it must have been incredibly opulent. Everybody has that reaction. Their mouths just drop open. They think, you know, am I in Rome or Greece? And here we are in Jewish Roman Palestine. This area has been inhabited for over 9,000 years. And no wonder. Two rivers converge here in the lush Jordan Valley, making for a plentiful water supply as well as rich soil. And its location also has strategic importance, as the road north from Jerusalem intersects here with the coast road from Lebanon. So I, I got to ask, I mean, how on earth would you pay for something like this? Well, the simple word is taxes. And the Romans insist that conquered territories pay their own way as well as pay for this sort of massive building. What kind of taxes are we talking about? There are individual taxes per head and their property taxes, their cuts into a certain percentage of produce. We think it might be anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. For the poor, it had to be truly oppressive. It wasn't graduated, so if it was 30 percent of a smaller amount, I mean, you could barely get enough to eat. So when it comes to first century jobs, ruling over another country and collecting taxes from them is certainly one of the most profitable. So if it's an oppressive tax regime, I mean, is this like 1776 where you have the taxation without representation? Actually, I think three times we have record that Herod Antipas, who ruled Galilee, he reduced the taxes. And the only reason he would do that is uh, the people were finally saying as an, enough is enough. Right. And so, the well, final revolt was even over taxes. So what happens if, if you can't pay? Is there any sort of tax break? I think it's almost like tightening screws. The client ruler Herod is watching to see how much you, pressure you can put on. In addition to all this splendor, which may not have interested the local workers who were paying for it, the Romans also used tax money to build roads and aqueducts, which did interest the locals. So there were mixed feelings towards the Roman conquerors and towards tax collectors. Not the most popular job then or now. But one of the disciples of Jesus was a tax collector, Levi, who was also called Matthew. With Jesus so opposed to Roman oppression, why did he have someone like this in his entourage? The Gospels tell us that Jesus is looking everywhere for sinners to repent, and I guess that includes tax collectors. Now, we know how the IRS reacts if you don't pay your taxes, but what was it like in biblical times? So what happens if there's a, a drought or a famine and, and you can't pay your taxes? There's no mercy. You could go to jail. You could lose your land. You know, maybe you own a family plot of land, and all of a sudden uh, it's uh, given over to some rich landowner. And were people killed for this? Was there execution for not paying your taxes? We do have examples of 2,000 people being crucified really? up and down the road here in Galilee. For not paying their taxes. Because they joined a, an anti-tax revolution. Imagine seeing crosses up and down a Roman road. Yeah, <laughs> I'd start paying my taxes at that point. That's exactly right. Beyond your basic greed, the Romans also found that taxing everything and everybody dovetailed nicely with that other pillar of empire building, trade. Trade routes allowed them to tax goods at every stage of the journey. And it was merchants, another important job in the time of the Bible, who had to deal with both taxes and trade. Getting your wares to the big cities sometimes involved a great deal of travel especially for certain goods that the city absolutely could not do without. For instance, in Jerusalem, they had to have frankincense. Without it, there could be no temple worship. Why not? What is frankincense anyway? And where does it come from? I've come to the Negev Desert to trace the frankincense trail and learn more about the men who couldn't do their jobs without it, the priests, the same men who clashed with Jesus. From this famous scene in the New Testament where Jesus overturns the money changer's table, I've been learning about the jobs all these people did in biblical times and how their professions could have brought them all to the holy temple in Jerusalem on that day. There was another very important job practiced by those who were already at the temple, the priest. 
priests were the link between the people and their god, performing animal sacrifices and burning a special incense called frankincense as an offering. Frankincense begins as a tree resin from southern Arabia, but to get it to Jerusalem, it used to have to go through this. I'm in the Negev Desert, taking the same route the merchants and camel drivers took. And I'm here to meet Yunus Aburabea and his herd of camels. Salam alaikum. This is my camel. Okay. What's his, uh, what's his name? Uh, Shailat. Shailat. Okay. Shailat. The job of camel driver hasn't changed much in 2,000 years. The most important thing is to look after your animal, because we're a long way from anything. They're incredible animals, smarter than the vehicles that replace them. And unlike cars and trucks, they can go over almost any terrain. Cover up my big head. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bedouins always feed their guests. And if we were ancient merchants, we would certainly need to be fortified for the journey, taking frankincense through the desert to Jerusalem. Mm. That is delicious. Now I'm ready for my first camel ride. Ole, kid. Okay. Oh, I'm on a camel. <laughs> That's great. And now what do I do? How do I, uh, you know, I should have read the manual before I, uh, I bought the camel. Okay. <laughs> There's no instructions for this. Right. Whoa. <laughs> That's the big camel. <laughs> uh -huh. Whoa. That is something else. This is the only way to haul cargo in the desert. These guys are the 18-wheelers of the Middle East. Out here, I can imagine that in the first century, there would have been hundreds of camels and caravans stretched out across the horizon, hauling goods from thousands of miles away towards Jerusalem. And there were jobs along the way, too. Since camels shed, their owners made money from their hair, which was used to make clothing. Remember spinning the yarn back in Nazareth? Imagine doing it while on the road to Jerusalem. Out here, you make use of everything you can, and you paid a toll or tribute to Rome in territories you pass through. No wonder frankincense was so expensive. By the time it got here to Jerusalem, it had been taxed to the hill. Sook or marketplace here in Old Jerusalem. A lot of things have changed over time, but you can still get goods here that were sold during biblical times. This is frankincense. We know it best as one of the gifts that was brought to baby Jesus by the three wise men. How much is this? This is 100 gram, 12 shekels. 12 shekels for, yeah. for one. For one, yeah. For one. Yes. Can I smell that? Yeah, sure. Sakran. It's very beautiful frankincense. That's beautiful, yeah. It's good for smell, good for memory, good for all, other, anything. Because that many people before 2,050 years ago, he's put it, all of this in his home. So 2,000 years ago, yeah, this was people. used. So everyone. Everyone. Uses. Some people believe frankincense to be an effective anti-inflammatory and current medical studies are testing other benefits. But the ancients knew that burning frankincense was an offering they had to make to God. It's still burned in churches today. And 2,000 years ago, pilgrims coming to Jerusalem and entering the temple would have inhaled its sweet fragrance. Three times a year, the Jewish people came to the temple from all over the world for the major festivals. I'm in old Jerusalem, and this is the Western Wall. It's the only above ground structure that's left of the temple that the Romans destroyed. The Temple Mount 
is the holiest place in Judaism, and the Western Wall is its only physical remnant. Just up here on Temple Mount, the very first temple was built about a thousand years before Jesus was born. People come here 365 days a year, 24 hours a day to pray in this square. Many of them write prayers on small scripts and place them in the wall. Others kiss the wall. The pilgrims brought animal sacrifices to the temple, but they didn't bring a goat or a dove with them halfway around the world. So the first thing they had to do was convert their currency so that they could buy animals to sacrifice. So what about this job, money changer? Did Jesus really object to it? After all, without it, pilgrims couldn't buy and offer their sacrifices. It wasn't the job. It was where the job was located, inside the temple. This crowded city of pilgrims attracted merchants of every kind. It was a good place for business. But Jesus didn't want the temple turned into a business. And some say the priests were allowing it to happen. I want to find out more about this job, which was unlike any other, and answered to a boss unlike any other. In the pressure cooker of Jerusalem, how did these priests balance religion, commerce, Rome, and the first century rebel? In the time of the Bible, Jerusalem was as busy as it is today. Three times a year, pilgrims came from all around to offer sacrifices in the temple that used to be beyond this wall. Jerusalem's pilgrims were great for local jobs, then and now. There were food vendors, there were hostel owners, and there were merchants of every kind. But unlike today, there were thousands of priests who served in the temple. These priests were in the temple to represent the people before their god, and nothing could interfere with them performing their holy functions. The most important functions were performed by the high priest. But under Roman occupation, there was plenty of interference with this job and Rome made sure that the man it wanted was appointed. His duty was to God, but pleasing Rome allowed him to fulfill that duty. So he and the other priests had a delicate tightrope to walk. Shimon Gibson is a world-renowned biblical archaeologist who directs excavations in Israel. He can bring us closer to the lives of these men, for whom ritual purity was the key to being able to do their job. So here you can see one of the gates uh, which led into uh, the temple area. This is the place where all the pilgrims who had been purified in the Salaam pool, and including the priests who had come from the upper city, would enter into the temple area. So everybody comes right through here? Exactly. And it must have been yes. a, a pretty chaotic scene if you've got all these people coming in. And... Fairly cha chaotic, but you had a very, very strict administration. How so? And had uh, the, the temple administrators they would make sure that only those who had been purified in the pools were allowed into the temple. Everyone had to immerse in a special pool called a mikvah before entering the holy temple. Its purpose was not for physical cleanliness, but for ritual purity. There were large mikvahs for the pilgrims, like this one, the Pool of Siloam, mentioned in the New Testament and recently discovered near where the temple stood. And the water was on different levels. So um, whenever the pool was at a lower level, then you'd descend the steps. If the water was at a higher level, then you could uh, remain uh, closer to so the So this went continually down it, like All that. the way down to the bottom. And the steps were on all four sides, which is quite nice. So you've got to imagine almost like a theater with all these people sitting around. Uh, and uh, they've all come here in order to purify themselves before going up to the temple. It was critical that priests become pure before entering the temple. One became impure by coming into contact with death. For instance, being in the presence of a dead body. And life's potential was sacred. So both the presence of semen that had not conceived, as well as menstrual fluid, required a trip to the mikvah. The priests believed that if they were impure when they entered the temple, 
everything they were trying to accomplish in the prayers for their people would fail. There were, and still are, strict rules about what kind of water could be used in a ritual bath. It couldn't be brought in by unnatural means. It had to be rainwater, or from a spring or river. Since nothing was more important than this ritual purity, some of the priests had their own private mikvahs. Shimon Gibson is digging in what is believed to have been a priestly quarter of ancient Jerusalem. And he has discovered what is believed to be a priestly house. So we're going to go down here. We're actually going to descend uh, through time, because we're at the level of the Ottoman period. Right up which here. Is, yes, which is uh, uh, mid-16th century. And we're going to go all the way down to 2,000 years to the levels from the first century, from the time of Jesus. Fantastic. So we're going to descend the elevator of time. How do you know that they were priestly houses as opposed to somebody else's house? Well, we have historical sources. We also have um, archaeological findings. Excavations revealed a house uh, with an inscription indicating that this was a house which belonged to the priestly uh, family. I mean, these were the neighbors of King Herod the Great and subsequently of the, the Roman governors of uh, Jerusalem because the Roman governor was situated just up a uh, slope from where we are. Jerusalem was a very wealthy city, uh, being the focus of pilgrims uh, three times a year. Those who lived in Jerusalem were able to sell their goods to them, were able to rent out uh, their houses. So you don't have a lower class in Jerusalem. You have the middle class, those who are better off and those who are less better off, and the aristocracy and the, the priesthood. People will sort of think of Jesus coming to, to Jerusalem and then uh, moving in and around, the, in between the houses of the poor. But there were no poor people in no... Jerusalem at the time. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, I never thought of that. So there's a lot of animal bones here, and uh, you can see them sort of scattered around. Here you can see a rib bone. Ah, oh, look, look. There's a coin. Do you see that green? It's corroded. It's green. That's why it's got that green sort of skin to it. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And what's nice is it's caught between these two stones. So it'll give us some information about when this uh, wall was constructed. Take it out. You are actually trusting me. Well, since you're here oh, at the right. site, you've got to dig it out. The one thing you don't do is rub the surface because it's corroded. And so it can actually peel away almost like an onion. And, and with it, it can take the image, which is on the, 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 the coin itself, on the metal. This is the loose change, just like you find loose change all over the place, modern and loose change, you know, same in, in antiquity. I have to um, give it up. Yes, you have to. It's, it's not a souvenir. From the okay. moment of discovery, it belongs to the state of Israel. That's, I knew that. That's, I knew that. That's the law. So there we go. And that is my, uh, my first ever archaeological find. Your fingers have touched history. I know. That's beautiful, it really. Mm. Mm. It's exciting. There's always a first time, isn't it? Touching history is quite a change from teaching it. But there's more to see as we descend further into history. Shimon is using geophysical mapping technology to see what hasn't yet been excavated. And he discovers something incredible at the lowest level of this house. And lo and behold, uh, in this area, we found this hidden chamber with its ceiling still intact. Oh, fantastic. It's really amazing. Oh, my. <laughs> You're in the cellar of the priestly house, and it's here that you have this mikveh, which is this uh, ritual pool. If you came in from the marketplace, you might have uh, brushed shoulders with a, a leper, which had uh, made you impure. So if you're entering into the house, the first thing you did was you went to deify yourself in, in the mikvah. Finding a mikvah in the home of a priest tells us just how crucial ritual purity was. It wasn't only in the temple. They needed to be pure everywhere they went in the city of God. When Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers, these priests would have felt that he was overturning their world. The delicate balance they had achieved between their God and the Romans. And here in his house, we can touch this man's life, this vanished job, temple priest. But this is extraordinary. By doing their jobs and finding out about their everyday lives, I've learned a lot about all the people who would have converged on the temple on a fateful day in the first century.
Warren Kislenko. My day job is teaching history, but now I want to live it. So I've come here to Israel to find out what life was like at the time of the Bible. Modern concoctions, ancient ingredients. Makes me wonder what people at the time knew about sickness and medicine. The Gospels report that people with a variety of ailments and diseases came to ritual baths such as this one, the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. The most famous was a blind man who would ask Jesus for help. Jesus mixes his saliva with the earth and puts it on the blind man's eyes, telling him to immerse in the Pool of Siloam. The blind man does, and then miraculously, he can see. It's an inspiring story, but I'm also interested in the other stories we see in this scene. Look at all these sick people. Why have they all come here? And which of them will get better? When you got sick in the first century, what did you do about it? Today when we get sick, most of us go to doctors. But what did they do in biblical times? To find out, I meet Dr. Leora Rosenberg. He collects ancient medical instruments and can tell me about what they knew in the first century. Are these so, actually first these are, century? These, these are, are biblical actually time? first century or even maybe older. These are Roman instruments. Many of them were found here. Dr. Rosenberg has ancient probes, lancets, Scalpels. This is going to get ugly, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Can I pick these up? Yeah, sure, but it's quite sharp. Well, it's a good thing I have a doctor with me, isn't it? Uh, OK, so this would be... So ow, this is ow, what we call the, the scalpel or the blade, the modern blade. OK. And this is a Roman blade. And a Roman. They look almost identical. Also, the size are very similar. And if you had a problem that couldn't be fixed with these cutting and sewing tools, there were objects in the shape of whatever problem you had to remind God what you needed help with. Surgery was not really practiced at that time. We became doctors, I mean, physicians, only in the 18th, 19th century. Yeah. Before that, we were barbers. Yeah, plain old uh, barbers. Yes. And carpenters and other tradesmen, whoever had sharp tools. Given this approach to surgery, it's understandable why you might pin your hopes on a miracle worker like Jesus, rather than go under the knife. Now, these are leeches, obviously. These are leeches. Can I, can I pick yes, them? Yes, sure. Okay. They would use this to bloodlet. Same principle same, in ancient same, times? The same principle, exactly. And in modern time, they're also used for bloodletting in microsurgery. So, so yeah. ancient times, time. ancient ways have made a comeback. Exactly. Unfortunately, they're about to make a comeback on me. Oh, come on. Other than hurt, what is this going to do for I mean, me? It's supposed to extract the bad blood out of your body and bring it to the surface and allow the good blood to remain. Once that bad blood comes to the surface, the leeches can suck it out of me. Great. Is that a special leech tube? Yes. What really? do you want it? No, no. This <laughs> Where is do I want it? Yeah. How about on you? He's smelling me, isn't yeah. he? Now, with this leech tube, I really can aim where I put it. Uh, no, you just feel it, that's why all. Why do I feel like I'm in a science fiction movie all of a sudden? Because you are. Do you feel any pain? He's stabbing yeah. me. Yeah. He's having lunch. Yeah. What kind of ailments would they have used this for? Uh, they use it for anything and in all parts of the body. They were using leeches on the forehead, really? on the nose, inside oh. the nose, the nostrils. They even were using on the lips, going down, obviously, oh. on the chest, on the back, on the hands, on the fingers, to treat hemorrhoid, which is... Wait, 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 wait. Hemorrhoid? Is, yes. Let's which, skip that one, all right? Some patients found out the hard way that excessive bloodletting wasn't always a help, but using cups and heat to bring what people call bad blood to the surface is still done today. Instead of glass, in biblical times, they would have used clay cups or animal horns. And for some ailments, they also used a variety of herbs. Because the climate hasn't changed that much around here in 2,000 years, many of those herbs are still growing today. I'm heading north with Sharon Kotzer, who's an expert in herbal medicine, because I want to find out how they used herbs to keep healthy in the time of Jesus. Beautiful. 
<laughs> yes, this is an amazing place. It's exactly, I guess, how it used to be 2,000 years ago. Nothing really changed here. Really? So this is exactly yes. like it would have been in the Bible? I think so. Look at this beautiful nettle. It's a this fantastic. This amazing color. But they used to take it and they used to uh, actually to whip the skin with it, all right? They used to do it because in cases of kind of inflammatory disease of the, of the joints, kind so of arthritis. Arthritis, okay, yes. right. Well, I've got arthritis. I think I'll give that a try. The blood supply decrease and lots of toxin accumulate. And when you do this, you actually stimulate the nerve ending and the blood supply to the area. So they had a variety of methods to stimulate the blood supply. If your problem was in a joint where cups weren't an option, you could use this herb. And it's a kind of counter irritant. That's it's bring a kind of new blood supply to the area. It's clean the affected joint. It was used, it's method for thousands of years by people. I'm definitely taking some of this home. I wonder if I can get it by customs. This is a kind of, of ramnus. This is quite a strong uh, Ram laxative. Ramos? Ramnus. This is from the sage family. It's called balota. 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 They use for lung problems, for lung disease. It's also a, a kind of mental relaxant. Sharon shows me some of the herbs that they would chew in biblical times. Willow bark for headaches, pistachio leaf for bad breath, and a mallow plant for ulcers. Okay. Marshmallow. Yeah, it's a marshmallow. It tastes it. See what you think. And I eat everything. Yeah, just eat it. It's very slimy. Yeah, yeah, very slimy. Right. Yeah. It creates a protecting kind of flare over inflamed mucous membranes. OK? For example, a mouse ulcers, ulcers of the stomach. Right any other inflammatory condition, and also on the skin, on burns. It's a protect and soothe. Probably one of the main edible plants of the Bible time. It's like you've got nature's medicine chest all over the place. Absolutely, that's Incredible. what we have. And today, healing ingredients from biblical times are combined in tasty concoctions. I've come to Jerusalem's Mahani Yehuda Market to meet a third generation healer named Uzieli because I want to see how he uses biblical fruits for health. Ah, welcome. welcome. nice to meet you. Welcome to Jerusalem. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. This is a pomegranate, mentioned in the Bible as one of the fruits the Israelites missed when they were wandering in the wilderness. I love pomegranate. Eat it. It's cholesterol, blood pressure. This is the new medicine in the market now. This is an etrog. It's an ancestor of today's lemons and limes. Biblical Jews planted them, and Uzieli uses every part. The juice for the stomach, that's fantastic. And the skin in a spray for everything else. Massage your face now. Deeper, deeper. Get go as deep as I can. Like that? Yeah. Keep it younger, no wrinkles. I'm more beautiful. More beautiful, yeah. I love it. You want me to stick this up my Yes, nose? yes. Do it like this, <laughs> do it like this. One drop. One drop. Jeez, man. <laughs> I'm getting okay. sprayed from every direction. Okay, this will open your ear. Do like this. You don't need medicine anymore. I have arthritis in my hands. Yes. So ancient times, what would I get? They use the ginger. Ginger, big stuff. The ginger will get inside. And also, if you have a problem in the back, you squeeze it. The like... ginger juice. <laughs> yeah. So what else? They, they have olives back then, 2,000 years Bobby ago. Grant. Pomegranate. Figs, you know? Figs, yeah, yeah. yeah. Figs, dates, uh, almonds. Almond. Fantastic. And you use the same stuff all the time. Yes. And it's not only biblical food. Uzieli also makes use of biblical animals. This is the hair of goats, black goats in the desert. We took the hair of the goats. Hair of the goat. And we make it together. And what does it do? In the desert, there's no medicine. So if you have migraine, uh, you just uh, uh, circle around your head, a little bit pain. Yeah. Ah. Yes. So you will not forget me, hey, we'll and the you pain like will this. go away. Now take your hand, press a little bit gently around your head. Yeah. That itches. That's scratchy. Yeah. And then, da. Okay. This will take away. The, I don't have any <laughs> hair up there to protect me. So. Maybe we'll grow up. <laughs> okay. That's what I need. I need some hair tonic. So in biblical times, there were some conditions you could treat, but blindness wasn't one of them. So once word got out that Jesus cured the blind man. People with all kinds of incurable conditions likely came to the Pool of Siloam, hoping he could help them, too. In addition to this body of water where people sought healing, there was a much larger one, and people still go there for its healing waters today. It's the lowest point on Earth, the Dead Sea. It's 10 times saltier than the oceans, 
which is what makes you float. You literally can't sink. But people don't just come here for that. How do you like the moat? Feels um, I don't really like it drying. I like putting it on, but yeah. now I'm kind of... But it's supposed to be good for your skin, so... Yeah, I need them. I was kind of hoping it grew hair, too. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to find out why they come from all over the world, I meet Dr. Marco Harari, who treats patients here. So, Dr. Harari, exactly why do people come here to your clinic? We are using the air, but also the earth and the sun. The air, because we have more oxygen here, about 6% more than any place in the world. Mm -hmm. The earth, because we are using the black mud and the salt from the Dead Sea. And the sun, because our sun is filtrated here and can allow a longer time to exposure to sun for many patients. So it's a very unique uh, weather condition, climatic it is, conditions. It is exactly a very unique condition, but it is not a new one. It's not new. We have some references from 2,000 years ago. So they did know uh, in biblical times uh, yes. to come here for their, for their yes. skin ailment. Cure for the skin diseases, rheumatologic diseases and lung diseases. I have arthritis, so if I came here uh, and used the, the mud in particular, I, I would get better. Surely, surely we have some data showing that people are improving for three, six months after simple applications of black mud. You know, this is the way to meet girls. It really is. Not married girls. <laughs> what exactly is the science behind this? How do you prove that people are being treated so well here? We understand that the combination of salt of the Dead Sea and ultraviolet B, UVB, of this area is a unique combination for improving skin diseases. But not only skin diseases, the black mud, for example, can be used for many rheumatic conditions, for joint diseases, for uh, musculoskeletal diseases. We know that people are in a good remission after treatment at the Dead Sea for at least eight to nine months, something that is pretty good for any kind of other treatment. So it is fantastic to see that without drugs, without medicine, we can reach at least the same <laughs> result than with medications. After being in the Dead Sea, I feel very alive. To treat my arthritis, I'd have to do three weeks of floating appointments, which would be fine with me. So far, I've found out what they did know about health in the time of the Bible. Now I want to find out what they didn't know. In this famous scene from the Gospels, Jesus miraculously gives sight to the blind man at the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. Today, you hear people saying they're praying for a miracle after they've already tried everything else. But in biblical times, prayer was the first thing you did. Even today, some people pray when they get sick, and some studies have shown it may work. The most famous scientific study showing that prayer has a positive influence on healing was a double-blind study done in San Francisco in 1982. Those coronary patients who were prayed for were in less need of ventilators and antibiotics. Some dispute these studies, but I want to find out more about the connection between prayer and health. So I'm meeting with Rabbi Ken Spiro. This book, the Torah, contains some of the prayers that Jews offer to God. The Torah also contains the commandments for how to live. So Ken, are there commandments, uh, some of the commandments dealing with things like, like your physical health, your, your public health? Absolutely. Sure. And it's interesting that many of the laws of ritual purity have shown to have side benefits that have been very beneficial in terms of hygiene and personal health, although they're not given for that reason. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the, the ritual purity. I don't, what exactly does that mean? Well, the ritual purity, again, it's, it, even though mikvah is a ritual bath and baptism comes from it, it's a side benefit that you're clean, but the purpose of, of ritual bath was not to clean yourself physically, but to unclog yourself spiritually. At the time, belief in spiritual purity was a belief in health. But on the physical side, cleanliness being next to godliness didn't always pan out in these ritual baths these mikvahs because of what people at the time didn't know about infection and germs. I'm on my way south to Qumran to see how this played out. Near the Dead Sea in the Judean desert is the first century home of the Essenes, a Jewish sect who wrote many of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
among the oldest biblical texts ever discovered. Found in these caves in 1947, after being hidden for 2,000 years, the Dead Sea Scrolls reveal to us a pre-Christian group of Jews who believed in the teacher of righteousness like Jesus and who were readying themselves for the final apocalypse. Since the end of days could happen at any moment, they kept themselves pure, and purity touched on everything, including going to the bathroom. But there was no bathroom out here. I'm with biblical scholar James Tabor because it was his team who discovered exactly where the Essenes put their latrines. We're on our way there now to see how their rituals of purity affected their health. And one of the things about the scrolls, besides religion and mysticism, is ritual purity, bodily things, blood, sex, death. And the toilets are precisely located outside the living area, at least 1,500 cubits. It's probably 700 yards or so. OK. And hidden away from the camp. It's quite the climb. Especially in an emergency. So here we are exactly where the Essenes went when they had to go. How did they do it? So we've got you in a white Essene tunic and a belt, and then you always have a spade or a, it's actually mentioned in the text. It's issued to you when you join the group. And it's not for gardening, it is for the latrines. So you need to dig a shallow hole. How big is this hole? You have to be able to cover it, so. That could vary from day to day, right? And is this actually in the scrolls? This is in the scrolls. How far down? How no, wide? Not how far down. Not that precise. Just that you dig a pit. Now squat over it. <laughs> lift, the dignity. Lift your robe. OK, robe's up. And let me know when you're finished. How did you know that it was right here well, or right there? We actually took a trowel like that, and we took samples all over, dozens and dozens of samples. All through here? All through here. And then we did soil tests on them. And we found intestinal parasites. Really? Whipworms, roundworms, tapeworms, eggs. And so we began to think, now wait a minute, uh, they're wearing sandals. This is like a toxic waste dump. They're actually getting it on their feet, walking back. And the worst thing in the world you could do is then go in a pool of water. But that's exactly what they did. After doing their thing 700 yards outside the camp, the Essenes would immerse in the waters of this mikvah before re-entering the community. Washing is good for hygiene, but the Essenes didn't know about sharing germs. That's bad for hygiene. You went outside the camp, you're coming back in. Before you enter the camp, you have to clean yourself. From our point of view, you're introducing these microorganisms we talked about that have infected the soil, right. these uh, parasites, intestinal parasites. So I, I bring them down from you the toilet? You bring them down. They're going to get all in your eyes, your mouth, your nose, any okay. cuts. They're on your feet. And they would be unaware of this. From a sanitation standpoint, everything's unclean. Yeah, I'm a time bomb, basically. So. I walk right into the community and spread. Yeah, the high cost of holiness. <laughs> A people not prepared to pay that high cost were the Romans, who were occupying the land of Israel at the time. They brought aqueducts, sewers, and improved sanitation to the Holy Land, which helped control the spread of disease. I've come to see the archaeological evidence in the Jordan Valley at Bet Shean. Now these are toilets. Isn't this incredible? This is amazing. This is the best example in the Holy Land of Roman indoor toilets. We should give it a try. I got to give it a see. try. I, I'm not going to coax you at all. I'm just <laughs> going to see if well, you do any better than my students. I'm guessing if I sit on the one, it could be a, a little messy. So uh, only. So I'll raise the, the toga. Raise the toga. OK. And then like this. Right. This is good. That's why I did a PhD in history. This is, uh, <laughs> this is yeah. Now I got I to ask you, this looks fairly sophisticated. So Let me join you, all right. if you don't mind. Not at all. Would you want me right next to you? Do you uh, mind? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> I think Give this, me some privacy. I think man. this works better like this. But there was no privacy. You were right next to your neighbors, quite a few of them. You've got the forum and the agora and all the marketplace, civic events, even the theater crowd getting out. 
So, okay, does everybody come here? That's the uh, kind of surprise. This is unisex, so... Uh, You're kidding. It's open, and uh, everybody comes. I guess the togas help a bit. It's a different view of the body. It's not Victorian or Puritan in any way. How does a system like this actually work? Well, there's water down below us, flowing continually for the waste. So in the first century, Jews were more concerned about privacy and less aware of infection. The Romans were less concerned about privacy and perhaps more aware of infection. The Jewish people focused on spiritual health as the underlying basis for physical health. Jesus's healings were also connected with his teachings. But in a time when great miracles of healing were believed to have taken place, it was also a time when a simple cut on the hand could kill you. I'm in Israel, learning all about what people in the time of the Bible did when they got sick. In this scene from the Gospels, Jesus cures the blind man at the pool of Siloam. Other sick people hoped he could cure them too. At the time, certain ailments could be treated. But just like today, the simplest things could kill you. Instead of a speeding car, back then, it could just be a sharp tool. Right in the modern city of Nazareth is this recreation of what it would have looked like when Jesus grew up here. I'm with biblical scholar James Tabor, and we're going to see how everyday tools could kill you. In the first century, this is how they prepared wool before using it to make clothing. The fibers had to be separated, and for that, they had a nice sharp tool. I could see how you would uh, easily cut yourself or impale yourself pretty yes. quickly. And get an and then, infection. Yeah, and then you know, of course, an what do you do? One, right? it's too mm. sharp. If she cut her finger and there's no tetanus shot, yeah, and then that... it swells up, and then you're going to get an amputated hand or you're going to, you know. So see there, she just did it. Now she'll die. No. So with no knowledge of conditions such as tetanus, how did people at the time deal with these unexplained deaths? This is Mayor bar -Alan who teaches Jewish history. I want to find out how common early death was in biblical times. Life expectancy was very low. I mean, for men, about 31 years of age, and women, 28 years of age. It, it, it's an average. It's right. statistics. But it tells you a lot. It tells you, for example, if you calculate the population, that people in antiquity, all of them suffered from loss of their beloved ones. It seems that in, in biblical times, they had a much uh, more familiarity with death, a greater awareness of death and acceptance. Is that true? Definitely, because they saw death in rates much higher than as modern people. For example, all women gave birth to, let's say, about six children. Six kids. About, right. about. But until the age of 18, 20, less than three survived. So infant mortality was 50% or, or more. Which tells you that each and every person lost his children or lost his brother or sister. Before Jesus could grow up to become the miracle worker we read about, he had to survive the greatest miracle of all, birth. When it came to both hygiene and survival in the time of the Bible, your first challenge was your biggest. I'm on my way to Bethlehem to see the spot where the most famous birth in history took place. It's believed that Jesus was born here, and to mark the spot, the Church of the Nativity was built. Many think the low door was made to force people to bow their heads before God, but it was really made to keep horses out. This place is extraordinary. Now I'm headed for what many people think is the very spot where Jesus was born. It's a star with glass, a bluish glass in the center. It looks beautiful now, but it might have been a little messier at the time. So what would the birth of Jesus have been like? In the time of the Bible, and sometimes today, the only experts at the scene were midwives. They were mentioned both in the Bible and in the Talmud, the book of rabbinic law. How did they approach childbirth? I've come to the Negev Desert to meet a 90-year-old Bedouin midwife named Naifa. Salam alaikum. It's an honor to meet you. Good honor. Thank you for having me. Uh, Naifa, can you show me uh, how you would have delivered a baby? How, when the baby comes out, what happens? 
العمود بتقول فيه كذي انا وبتظلها شاده العمود وقايله لي كذي انا وفي بتكون حرمه لابطه ظهرها من ها بتكون عندها وحده وفي ماسكه العمود لما العيل يطيح تمسك العيل وبنلفها على على السر وبنلفها بنمكنها خرق غليظ يعني تحوض السر وبنربط عليه وبنمكن بنقص حبل السر بندفن الاخت بناخذ العيل بنمقطه وبنربط بنحط من سره من صرت من سره يعني they take the blood of the baby and put it on the baby on the baby it's against evil eye so it's against the evil eye so while delivery hasn't changed some rituals around it have the evil eye was caused by the jealousy of others and the baby had to be protected from it and if there were problems during the delivery they would blow the shofar this ram's horn in this case, used as a biblical 911 to get the attention of the healing powers above. Can I try? Yeah, of course. In ancient days, they also used incantation bowls, which were believed to protect the house or tent. Many of them were to help childbirth. They had images of and spells against Lilith, a demon said to prey upon babies. I want to find out more about these rituals for protection. So I'm on my way to an antiquity shop in the old city of Jerusalem to meet archaeologist Robert Deutsch. Hi, Robert. Hi, Alan. How are you? Very nice to meet you. Welcome, welcome. It's a beautiful store. It's yes, really... I'm always coming over here to see some new stuff. I mean old stuff. Old stuff. <laughs> this incantation bowl Robert is holding is a 1,500-year-old spell to ward off evil written in the language spoken in the time of Jesus, Aramaic. You can hold it. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> you trust me well enough. It's uh, an incantation ball uh, with spells against evil, against illness. I can't believe it's in such good shape, eh? If the words incantation, spells, and evil make you think of magic, you're dead right. At the time, people believed in it. Everybody would have had one of these bowls in their house? Everybody needs a bowl. Right. Otherwise, the house is in danger. You deposit it in the corner of a house and uh, it protects the house against evil. You would bury one of these bowls upside down underneath your house to trap evil spirits, like ancient feng shui. This is the medicine in those days. And if I get better, then obviously it's the yes. bowl. So people back then believed that a, a demon or evil spirit was in you. That's what made you sick. That was the cause of illness. So we try to surround ourselves with the good spirits. Right? Yes, and, and we really need ones. those uh, tools in order to fight them. For example, this item here, this is a bird. It's made of ceramic. How old is this? It's about 2000 BC. That's amazing, though. It's 4,000 years old. Yes, but it's not only a bird. She knows to sing. You know how? No. It is a rattle. <laughs> It's cool. This is to scare the evil spirits. And you have to have it, otherwise you will be That's great. sick. Well, I always carry my uh, lucky coin and a lucky stone that I've had for like 20 you years. Have it. So it's you the have same it. principle. It's the same thing. So Robert, tell me about the evil eye. Well, the evil eye, it's a bad spirit and you must have an amulet against it. We're walking through the old city. And everywhere you see these hands called hamsas. These are amulets people place on their houses for protection and against the evil eye. This is the hand you're talking about, right? This is the hamsa. Yes, that's a hand. It uh, looks like a hand with five fingers, which uh, in Arabic, hamsa, it's five. But those are new, 19th century, 20th century. Considering how many of these hamsas are sold, people still believe in the power of objects to protect their homes and keep bad spirits away. For some, the hand symbolizes the hand of God. But what if putting one of these on your house doesn't work and your health is in jeopardy? Well, there are still those who practice magical rituals from biblical times. Were there really miracle workers at the time of Jesus? And what did you do if even they couldn't help you? Some people turned to magic. But since the population was Jewish, 
I need to find out how Jews viewed magic. So I'm asking Rabbi Ken Spiro. Are there mitzvot about things like magic? Because sure. people on the margins, I mean, people in desperate situations, tend to turn to those things. There's, right? actually, there's actually a lot of discussion and even laws about about this stuff. Most of it is negative. Most of it is associated thousands of years ago with idolatry and paganism. So 2,000 years ago, I want to engage in some magic. That would depend who you go to see about it. Generally speaking, the magic stuff is frowned upon. Um, but if you had a big rabbi, and he says, you know, I have access to a certain remedy or cure that's a tradition that's been passed down to me that, you know, you know most people don't know about it. Um, and you could, you're welcome to do this, fine. But it has to come from a recognition that everything comes from a higher power. So it's who you are, in effect. It's who you are, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. So in ancient times, people would seek out rabbis with these magical secrets, but it still goes on today. I'm on my way to see Rabbi Chaim Fuchs because he studied the ancient texts and learned the magical rituals that were believed to bring people back to health. As we've seen, there was a widespread belief in the power of the evil eye to bring harm. It was caused by the jealousy of others, and if you hadn't protected yourself from it, now you had to remove it through rituals such as the one Rabbi Fuchs is about to perform on me. He's adding molten lead to water, and he tells me the result is an eye shape. Uh-oh. This is a shape of, a, of an eye. Usually, when we pour lead inside of a water, it should be like this. Okay. Where does this come from? You tell me where that comes <laughs> this is, from. This says that you have someone that bugs you a little bit with an evil eye. So somebody has, has put an evil eye on me. Yeah, just a little bit. You don't have a lot. What do you mean a little bit <laughs> of an evil eye? So they only hate me slightly. They're jealous of you. They're jealous of me. Now, how do I how do I ward off this evil eye? Then this is what we do. You're gonna do it for me. I'm glad to see my evil eye melting away. There, that gives me some comfort. Okay, you heard this one. <laughs> Yikes! I'm getting a little nervous with hot lead over my head. But you can see, you heard this explosion. This this tells us that the evil eye just got out. We won. We won. And you can see it, nothing here. Wow. Well, that was close. Was the evil eye really removed from me? Or is this just superstition? In the time of the Bible, as today, there's no shortage of beliefs around healing, charismatic healers, and people who seek them out. But not all charismatic healers were rabbis, then or now. Why are large numbers of people drawn to these mysterious healers? To try and find out, I'm on my way to see Oren Zarif, a very busy healer around here. Excuse me. Come. If I'm not mistaken, Oren, you don't have any medical training, physiology or, or biology or anything. So I'd like to ask uh, Oren, how does he diagnose and now I give you a lot of energy of the body. I penetrate by the subconsciousness. I want you two minutes. Close your eyes, okay? Close your eyes. Very good. Now I give you a lot of energy all the body. Slowly, slowly, you will feel better. Okay. Shaloti. Orn, do you consider yourself to be a, a miracle worker? Megadol klum. I feel like I'm a tool to give to people and give to people. No, 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 עם כוח ויכולת, כפי שאני מעביר לאנשים, הוא היה מסוגל להתגבר על כל בעיה. שיקום פה אחד עכשיו, מכל 100 מטופלים, או 400 או 500 איש שמגיעים אליי ביום, שיגיד, אני לא מאמין, לא תמצא דבר כזה. מאמינים? כן. כולם מאמינים. 
and they don't need explanations for their belief. You can't explain what it is. And I don't want to know what it is. I don't Why want, I want to feel so... better. Clearly, Oren is giving these people something. But is it real or fiction? In the story at the Pool of Salome, was it psychosomatic? After all, a blind man is said to have regained his sight. And it turns out that the Pool of Salome is not just a place in a story. Archaeologists have now found the actual pool, and it's right near where the Holy Temple stood. In 2005, the Public Works Department of the City of Jerusalem was digging here to put in a new sewer line. What was also uncovered was a line to the past, the Pool of Siloam. I'm with archaeologist Shimon Gibson, and we're heading to the exact place mentioned in the Gospels. So this is the Pool of Siloam, where according to uh, the Gospel of John, uh, the blind man was cured by Jesus. So what you have is um, Jesus, he comes to Jerusalem. When he arrives in the temple area, he's only one of many voices, mm. uh, many opinions. But the only place where he really has an audience is in those pools. So this is where he performs his miracles. Yes. And they're a captive audience, if yes. you will, right? The lepers, those with disfigurements, disabled people of one sort or another, people who had different kinds of uh, scaly skin or rashes. So we're actually standing here on the steps that so Jesus himself probably walked down. You have a landing here, and then you have another flight of steps, another landing. So the landings were used for the placing of beds. So the infirm, the, the, those who were invalids, uh, will be able to get into the pool as well. So now that we're in the actual place, what exactly did Jesus do here? He's able to sort of conduct healing activities, uh, signs and wonders, uh, and miracles. In those days, um, something which was um, unusual, and that is somebody who did not profess to be a doctor as such, but was able to cure people, that was miraculous. You see, you see. so um, I, I think that Jesus was very special and he had uh, a very deep connection to um, an understanding of how to help people who had disabilities of all sorts. And I think he, he was a person who had an understanding of medical matters without the medical training. So was Jesus a first century doctor? Let's see if he fits the bill. I'm going to ask archeologist Gabby Barkai. We've come to an ancient place that Gabby discovered it's where you ended up if you couldn't find any kind of doctor or miracle worker, or when life had run its course in the usual way. It's what remains of an ancient burial site dated to seven centuries before Jesus. When you died back then, they would put you on these very slabs with your head nice and comfy and these headrests. You had nothing else to do but wait for your flesh to fall off. A year or so later, when you were nothing but bones, they would put you in here with the bones of your ancestors and some of your worldly belongings. Gabby found human bones here, as well as ivory, gold, and something much more precious. We had two silver scrolls, which include verses from uh, the Bible, from the book of Deuteronomy and the book of uh, Numbers. And these are the earliest biblical verses ever discovered. They predate the Dead Sea Scrolls by four centuries. This is one of the scrolls that Gabby found. It's an amulet meant to be worn on the body with the name of God written on it for protection against harm. And the verse from the book of Numbers written on this four inch scroll is the priestly benediction, which is still said in synagogues and churches today. It's a blessing of God's protection, a formula for health. And you excavated all of this. You're the man responsible. Yes. That's astonishing. So. so what does that tell you about the people who, who built this and who were buried here? Uh, they believed that the dead continued to live in another sphere. Right. Uh, unlike later on, uh, where they uh, believed in resurrection, they believed in this time that they do not need a resurrection because they are alive. And death was something like sleep. So Gabby, I've been reading and hearing an awful lot about uh, healing powers and medicine at the time of the Bible, and especially about Jesus and his healing powers. What do you think about all that? In one of the texts of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have a description of the Messiah as a healer. So it was a popular belief at that time that if somebody is a Messiah, 
He needs to be a healer as well. They can cure you of everything. Uh, he can cure you of all your uh, physical and mental problems. Healing was either with the word of God or with the uh, charismatic figure of the healer. It was by a touch, if he was charismatic enough, the psychosomatic influence of his blessing could heal you. And we have some cases of different maladies identified in uh, excavations and uh, they were cured. We have from uh, the fourth millennium BC and on, drilling a hole in the skull to free the pressures within the skull was well known to these people. So brain surgery. And in, in a... some cases, the brain surgery even succeeded. We have growth of the bone after the operation. Do you think there's any plausibility to the, the Pool of Siloam, the miracle at the Pool of Siloam? Listen, I wasn't there. <laughs> but I can tell you that it is possible. We have uh, many cases of uh, healing uh, which were regarded as miracles uh, in antiquity, but actually uh, behind them is some basic knowledge of uh, medicine. But if Jesus was a kind of doctor, he also seems to have done referrals. In the Gospel of Luke, 10 lepers called out to Jesus for help, and he tells them to show yourselves to the priests. They do, and they are healed. What did the priests know about curing leprosy? Well, it turns out it may not have been leprosy, but a different disease called tsaras that's been mistranslated as leprosy. So what is tsaras, and why did the priests deal with it? According to the Bible, some physical ailments were a result of spiritual problems. And to identify Tsaras, you needed the right specialist. 2,000 years ago, do I consider this, what, to be a medical problem? Or? That's the, pre the priest's primary job was to tell you this is a medical problem, this is a metaphysical problem. How, how would you know the this? difference? Ah, because the priest was trained. That's one, of the, that's one of the specialties of the priesthood was to identify this Tsaras, as it's called. They would have to come to your house and be able to diagnose it. No wonder the Bible talks so much about leprosy. It's referring to more than one disease. But it's now been proven that at the time they did have what we now know as leprosy. We know this because Shimon Gibson discovered the oldest leper ever found in Israel. Don't let the flowers fool you. In biblical times when your life was going down the tubes, this was one of the places you ended up. So this is Hell Valley. So it's a place with a lot of uh, blood and gore and guts, you know. In fact, uh, this is the, the field of blood, you know, at Goldama, where Judas, uh, after he betrayed Jesus, uh, then came and uh, uh, hung himself on a tree or garroted himself. Oh, this is the spot? Yes. So I'm in the place where the Gospels tell us the man who betrayed Jesus died. It's also where the oldest leper ever found in the Holy Land was discovered. I'm with archaeologist Shimon Gibson, the man who found him. He was wrapped in a shroud in here. So this is the tomb. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to find out what Shimon's amazing discovery here tells us about disease in the first century. I was really amazed when I saw in one of the recesses a shroud, wow. a shroud from 2,000 years ago. It's the only shroud that we have in Jerusalem uh, from the time of Jesus. And this was found in this tomb. So you see, this is where we found the shrouds in this uh, oh, barrel recess. Wow. That's um, very big. And this one yes. Is well, it's, big. A, it's the length of a human being. And um, when we came in, all we could see were, was this little black stuff which was on the floor of this uh, barrel recess. But when I look, I went into the barrel recess, I could see that uh, you had all sorts of fragments of uh, textiles. And right at the end, I could see this pile of stuff which turned out to be human hair and fragments of uh, skull. Human hair right at the back. Yes. But the question is, why was this person not reinterred and put into an ossuary, or his bones were collected with his other family members? In biblical times, after they left your corpse for a year or so so that your flesh could fall off, you always received secondary burial. In Jesus' time, your family came back and put you into bone boxes, ossuaries, but the man Shimon found did not get a secondary burial. Why didn't his family return for him? Not only that, but you see that there's this plaster. You see the edges of the plaster all the way around. So the door 
uh, was placed here at some point, and uh, he had been uh, almost sort of locked away inside. Sealed so, into the into the yes. vault. So it's a bit of a mystery here. Did you suspect that when you first saw the the hair and the fragments at the back that this was? I had an anthropologist with me, and she looked at one of the bones and said, "Hmm, signs of pathology." So we did some uh, medical examinations uh, on the the skeletal remains, and we did DNA research, and you know winging all uh, the specialists in, in the field, it turned out that uh, this shrouded man died of uh, leprosy. Until this man was found, historians believe that in the Bible, leprosy referred to any number of skin conditions. And there was no proof that any of them were leprosy. But Shimon Gibson's finding here confirmed that in Jesus's time, leprosy did exist. When it came to death, however, uh, the family members would have been uh, afraid. So they just would have uh, put him in and closed the door, sealed him up, and said, and this probably put something on outside, say, do not open, you know, and, and that was that. So not only does this tomb tell us that leprosy existed in the time of Jesus, it tells us about people's fears. His family didn't even want to touch his bones after he died for fear of catching the disease. They seem to have known that diseases can be contagious, an idea that didn't catch on until 12 centuries later. Depending on the luck of the draw, some would say the will of God, some diseases led you to a dead end, and no doctor, miracle worker, or magical healer could help. It's easy to believe that people in the past only had untrained healers and were missing out on the benefits of modern medicine. But is it possible that in our embrace of modern procedures, some of us overlook the value of more traditional healing methods? I'm on my way to meet a man who may have some answers for that. He doesn't depend on magic, miracles, or medicine. And he must be doing something right because he's 106 years old. It's very nice to meet you, sir. Thank you for meeting with me. Thank you. Now, I, I was told that you're 106 years old. Is that right? Yes. I've been married to Gili, Gili, Jerusalem, Shimi, Abraham, Babayov, and I'm a very good person. I'm a very good person. I have a lot of people who are very good. I'm a very good person. Now, I was told that in your whole life that you have never, ever been to a doctor. Is that right? No, I don't have a doctor. 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 People say, I'm a doctor. 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 I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. Why do you say that they are in the sky? Why do you say that? They say that they are in the sky, they are in the sky. But have you yourself ever been sick in your whole life? No, I don't have pain. So how do you, how do you maintain your health? No, I don't have pain. How much a man eats less, he gets more sick. We go to the hospital, we get more pain, more pain, more pain, more pain, and we don't have anything. You want to live long, you don't have to worry about it. 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 Then it's very, very difficult. The health of the health is tough. So your good health is because of your belief in God? I wanted to ask you about the, the evil eye. Do you know a lot about this, about these kind of symbols? What do you think about the use of amulets and, and magic? You don't practice any sort of, uh, you know, uh, special rituals or something to keep yourself well? That was great. Just like those who flock to the pool of Siloam, for many people, the physical and the spiritual are connected. We're searching for more than help. When the blind man received his sight, maybe what he received was insight. 
Today, we have more scientific answers, but we still have medical questions and fears. I think it was the same in the first century. Then, as now, people believed they had places to turn to get better. My name is Arne Kislenko. I teach 20th century history, but I've come here to Jerusalem to find out what life was like in the first century. There's plenty of security today all over this city, but that's nothing new. 2,000 years ago, temple guards and soldiers converged in Jerusalem's Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus, setting in motion the most famous trial of all time. But I want to know who all these people are, what laws govern their lives, and what brought them all together on this fateful night. Because here, we're not only seeing the arrest of Jesus, we're seeing what happens when two societies collide. At the time, the Roman Empire was occupying Judea. So in the first century, how did the Romans keep the peace among people who had totally different beliefs about law and order? I'm in what many believe is the Garden of Gethsemane, the exact place where Jesus was arrested. It's hard to know exactly what happened that night, but we know that a crowd of soldiers arrived to arrest Jesus, and they wanted it done quickly and quietly. I'm going to explore with a modern arrest specialist how he would have conducted the operation. Nir Kauron is a former commando with the Israeli special forces. You know, imagine that this is the scene of Jesus's arrest and you're running the operation for the Romans. How many guys, what kind of techniques? You would have to have some, some regiments outside, maybe not very visible, standing by for crowd control, and then the small force, the snatch and grab force that's probably built of the informant. So someone that he knows, someone that he respects and, and has no problem, and trusts, right. exactly. So a guy like Judas. A guy like Judas is, is, is a perfect informant in a way that he describes the routine, he describes the area of the operation. Right. This and is, you do it at night. Right, for maximum at, opportunity. At night, of course. Right. Yeah. Wait till they're, you know, tired and the night of the op, which is coming in, getting everyone ready, getting, you know, getting into positions. They might need a sign. And I think that's why maybe he kissed him. Comes in and kisses him, that's a sign. This is our man. And then they grab him. And if something does go wrong, I mean, if somebody fights back or they're on to them, then it's, it becomes immediately a, a, a noisy op. And that means the, the whole contingency has to come in, secure the area, and, 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 and ready to fend off maybe crowds, maybe the disciples inside that are getting crazy. If you see that there's going to be trouble, maybe take oh. him, <laughs> bring him out, bring him out here, okay. and then secure him, OK? And then all the others surround us. We're yeah. waiting for the contingency to come in, and then we take him out and, and leave as fast as we can. According to the gospel, Jesus goes quietly across that valley. He spent a long night awaiting his fate. The simmering tension of Roman occupation of the Jewish people had boiled over. But the imposition of Roman law affected everyone's life here in the first century. The Romans divided their soldiers into legions, which were groups of 6,000 men. They had 30 legions, but they were scattered throughout the empire. There were only about 500 Roman soldiers regularly stationed in Jerusalem, and the local population was estimated at 60,000 Jews. So how did they rule? I'm on my way to Jordan to find out, because there, in a well-preserved ancient city, the Roman army has been reconstructed. This is the ancient city of Jerash, and it is magnificent. Here, at the main gates, you get a real sense of empire, the power and the might of the Romans. I'm meeting Stellan Lind, who runs a historical reenactment of Roman gladiators and charioteers. They would have had their informers to find the, the guys who made the most uh, trouble, and they would arrest them and they would torture them and put them in jail, and in the worst case, of course, have them execute. We have this image of the Romans as being so effective, so powerful. Mm. I mean, what makes them so effective? What made them this, you know, ideal fighting force? When they attacked, they attacked line after line after line. When nine lines deep, 
And so one line came forward and fought for about eight minutes. They went back and uh, had their wounds tended to, and then the next line came, and then the next line came. So it was a really killing machine, you know. Pretty formidable enemy to fight. I think it's time I tried my hand at being a formidable enemy. But first, I need to learn about my weapons. Here you have the Gladius, the sword. Gladius having given the name to the word gladiator, by the way, a short stabbing sword. You stab with it, you don't fight like that, you stab. It's very short. Is it, it is very way? short because they calculated that for the stabbing technique that they had in fighting, that was the best length of the sword. They calculated light. the Romans were very, very smart in engineering and into the minutest detail. And it's very and light as well. This is the pilum, the throwing javelin. And let's look at the tip here, you know? It's a little bit like a bullet point here. Yeah. And the width of the steel here is just so that it bends when ah. it has penetrated the enemy. That right is, there, it yeah. right there. The idea with bending, of course, is that it makes it impossible for the enemy to use it and throw it back at you. That's uh, a one-time spear. It, it's a one-time spear, it looks exactly. It really is light. Again, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm exactly. Amazed. A they dagger. were well equipped, and they knew that they were much better equipped. And the enemy also knew that, which was, of course, a very, very important psychological fact. Scare the enemy. Scare isn't? the enemy, absolutely. Well, I'm ready to get suited up to scare the enemy. How long does it take you to dress? I'm with those shoes here. <laughs> I'm looking good. The Roman army developed many ingenious uses for its shields. They weren't only used for protection. They'd hit you with them. And they'd use them in formations such as this for group protection. And look at this deadly formation. I wouldn't want to find myself facing that. So the Romans ruled by intimidation. But what are they doing here? What do they want? I'm on my way to Jerusalem to ask professor of history, Joshua Schwartz. The Romans are interested basically in peace and quiet and that people should pay their taxes when they're supposed to. If Jews had problems with one another or if they had problems with their neighbor, then there was a Jewish court system, there was a Jewish legal system. And the last thing in the world that they would do would be to turn to a Roman official and to seek justice from that Roman official. So it sounds like as long as things weren't, let's say, political in orientation, that the, the Romans sort of live and let live and let, let Jewish courts deal with Jewish issues. The Romans, when they interfered, normally they asked you whether you were guilty or innocent. And if you said innocent, they tortured you until you you said guilty, and at that point, they usually put you to death. Did the Romans really have a, a sophisticated understanding of Jewish legal systems? The Romans had almost no understanding of what Jewish life was and what Jewish legal life was. One of the mistakes that the Romans made was that they considered this neck of the woods to be the same as everybody else. But the fact is that the Jews are not, in that sense, like everybody else. Religious issues, as far as the Jews were concerned, made them very, very different. This difference was the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, which govern every aspect of Jewish life. It's because of a law in the Torah that Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem on that fateful night. It was a religious holiday, Passover, a time when the Torah commands Jews to come to Jerusalem. In Judaism, religion, everyday life, and politics all overlap because the Torah doesn't differentiate between them. I'm meeting with Rabbi Ken Spiro, who's showing me the Torah. Its contents have not changed in over 3,000 years. I want to find out how Jewish law works. So the, the Torah scroll is the law? Yes, it's, it's, it's called the written law. So these are the commandments, the commandments are in here. All the 613 commandments are expressed in the text itself. And the 613 are, are the, the mitzvot. Th those are called the mitzvot, yes, that is the Torah. People assume, you know, 10 commandments, but they're actually 613. That's a lot more. <laughs> and there's a lot of, a lot of details. Let's say that uh, I, I steal a, a goat. Is, okay. is there a specific sure. commandment? There's, there's a whole things? discussion here about uh, if a person steals property. If I steal a goat, there's a law which states that not only do I have to return or replace it, I have to give an additional goat as a fine. In an agricultural society where your animals were extremely important, 
The point of this law would be to discourage stealing. The Torah's laws cover everything. They cover what Jews can eat and cannot eat. There's a commandment to rest on the Sabbath, and it even tells them how to take eggs from a bird's nest. First, you must shoo the mother away so she won't have to see her children taken from her. There's even a law about writing the law. All Torahs must be written by hand. The Torah is revered by Jews who have lived by its laws, even when, as in the case of Jesus, it brought them into conflict with the occupying power of Rome. Jesus often quoted the law. He was fulfilling Torah obligations on this night. Before he was arrested, he and the disciples ate what is called the Last Supper, which was the Passover meal, commemorating the exodus out of Egypt. The Torah commands every Jew to have a Passover meal, and part of that meal had to be some meat from a lamb sacrificed in the temple. The Romans must have found all this very strange, but as long as the taxes were paid, they allowed the life of the temple and its laws to continue. Behind me, you can see the Western Wall. The temple that used to be on the other side of that wall was the most important place in the Jewish world before the Romans destroyed it in the year 70. But the temple wasn't only the spiritual center of Jewish life, it was the place where the highest Jewish court, the Sanhedrin, would convene. I'm with archeologist and historian Shimon Gibson, and we're heading underground to see the place where the Sanhedrin may have met. So this is a labyrinth of uh, tunnels and arches and passages. Ground level in the first century has been buried by two millennia of building, but excavations have revealed buildings that were near the temple and not destroyed. I want to find out what effect Roman occupation had on the powers of the Sanhedrin. And look at this amazing room. It's great, isn't it? Uh, this is beautiful. It's very well preserved. It dates from the first wow. century. Uh, based on the sources, it might even be where uh, the Sanhedrin sometimes uh, convenes. So the High Court. This would have the, been high, the court. high Court. I wanted to ask you about the, the connection between the Sanhedrin and the, and the High Priests. Did the Romans appoint the High Priest? The High Priest was actually appointed by their priesthood. But of course, uh, on occasion, the Romans would intervene. They would manipulate uh, things behind the scenes to make sure that they got the candidate that they required. How far could they intervene? Clearly, they had a lot of clout in the first century and at times were able to really to push things. The Romans were putting pressure on the high priest. And we can see that pressure playing out around the arrest of Jesus. The men arresting Jesus are the temple guards who report to the high priest and these Roman soldiers are watching to make sure the situation doesn't get out of hand. In the first century, conflicting laws put the pressure on everyone, whether you were a merchant or a messiah. I'm in Jerusalem, in the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm walking in the actual place where many people believe 2,000 years ago, Jesus was arrested. I'm finding out how the Roman occupation of ancient Israel helped create the tensions which led to this arrest. It also led to conflicts for everyone else. Jesus was arrested at Passover, which celebrates freedom from slavery in Egypt. But under Roman occupation, Jews were slaves to taxation. Before the Romans came, Jews had taxation mandated by the Torah. The law of gleaning, for example, was a safety net for the poor to try to make sure no one went hungry. I'm meeting Joseph Gittler, who founded Leket Israel, an organization of volunteers who keep alive the law of gleaning. You know, gleaning is a, a biblical imperative, which uh, farmers were required to apportion a certain part of their fields for the needy. So what we're doing today is a, I would call it a modern take on a biblical law. And uh, we're working with farmers throughout Israel who uh, allow us to come into their fields and uh, glean fruits and vegetables to distribute it to unfortunately needy people throughout the state. Joseph, how exactly did, uh, did the law apply to 2,000 years ago? Farmers were required to allow poor people to uh, come in hmm. and actually pick the fields. Say a, a portion, meaning set aside a, a chunk of your land. Yeah, generally. So, did you know how much it was? Or, generally, or? it was about 10% of your field had to be left for the poor. The gleaning law helped keep the poor from going hungry, 
But because of Roman taxation, it also put more pressure on farmers who had less product to sell. The most famous gleaner in history was an ancestor of Jesus. Her name was Ruth. Not far from here, near Bethlehem, she gleaned in the fields of a man named Boaz. They fell in love, they had a child, and about 40 generations later was Jesus. Gleaning is a positive commandment, one of the thou shalt's. I also want to find out about the thou shalt nots. So I've come to Jerusalem's Mahane Yehuda market to meet Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer. Yom Tov, we're in a, we're in a market, and I'm thinking, are there must be lots of commandments that, uh, that apply around here, right? I mean, for, for example, are uh, the prices of things. Is that, uh, you know, is, is that ruled by commandments as well? Yeah, for sure. Um, the idea in general is, as you know, monotheist, is that it's not just that there's one God, it's that God is one. He's indivisible, and this is all going on ultimately in this entire world is like a figment of God's imagination. A giant video game to see if you and I will treat each other with oneness, i.e. win-win. So if I'm doing business with you in the shuk, I'm, buy I'm buying some produce or something, so that, yeah, there's price issues. For example, he can't overcharge me. Yeah, but is that, is that, that's actually in the commandment. That's actually a commandment. The commandment, the commandment is basically don't steal. And in this case, it's also the commandment, because you're really stealing in a way. If you're taking his money above the market, but there's a separate commandment besides stealing, and that is not to afflict financially. Not to overcharge. Don't take advantage of people financially. Wow. So afflicting. he can't rip me off, but if I steal one of these grades, did I just, did I just break the commandment? Uh, well, you know, there is that old thou shall not steal one. But isn't this just really a, a list of, uh, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't... It right. sounds kind of like that. There's nothing arbitrary. You'll notice the don'ts are always kind of centered around where people are most selfish, which is two parts of the body, OK? Right. Survival and reproduction, right. which we share with the animal kingdom. Wherever it's animal instinct stuff, so you'll notice a lot of negative commandments. Right. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, when the so that your is... animal hasn't taken over the soul. I get it. So it's about that balance, yeah. achieving that balance. So like the Sabbath, there's a lot of don't do's. The commandment to keep the Sabbath may explain why Jesus was arrested on what scholars believe was a Thursday. He couldn't be arrested the next day because Jewish courts could not meet on the Sabbath, which begins at sundown on Friday. But what is the reason behind this day of rest? The Sabbath is a biggie because it's one of the most fundamental principles in Judaism that uh, God created the world. And observing the Sabbath as a way that the Jewish people individually and collectively throughout history have basically one day a week bore witness to what is the most, fun, this most fundamental of concepts. 2,000 years ago, how was the, the Shabbat observed? You could stoke your stove up prior to the Sabbath, but once it went cold, it was out. You could light your lamps, but once they burned out, that was it, you know? But more or less, it was the same thing. Certainly in an agrarian society, this is a huge innovation. We stop working and the world works without us because God runs the world ultimately. And we should be using one day a week to focus on that and to grow spiritually and to get out of the rat race. It's Friday today. And much as they did in the first century, religious Jews are preparing for the Sabbath, honoring the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Jews followed their laws and the Romans imposed theirs keeping a close eye on these people who took time off from work for their Sabbath. To the Roman way of thinking, this could be trouble, giving the Jews too much time to think about who is now running their land. I want to learn more about how the laws of the Sabbath were followed then and now. So I'm headed to the home of Shoshana and Rabbi Yitzhak Goldstein. The Sabbath is always welcomed with a meal, and I'm here to help out. We're going to make our challahs now. We're going to make a dough. And this is like bread, right? right. Oh, okay. Special prayer for Shabbat. Six like cups it. of lukewarm water. Olive oil, sugar. Okay, you're good. One. One of the laws governing Shabbat is that all meals eaten on this holy day, from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, must be made before the sun goes down on Friday night. And there are 39 specified activities that one cannot do once the sun goes down every Friday. I always thought this was only because one didn't work on the Sabbath, but there's more to it than that. There's the work of creation. But the whole day is you want to symbolize God. God says, I rest on a Saturday. I didn't create on Saturday. Okay. Be like me, don't do work of creation. Okay. So to do work, to pick up a chair, I'm allowed. 
Okay, so I can't draw a picture. Exactly. Okay. And we know we're going to run into problems. We'll prevent. Like, if you go into our, our kitchen, you open the, the refrigerator. You we, go in. We unscrew the light, light bulb. That when you open the refrigerator, you don't create that light. Have you ever missed a Sabbath dinner? No, never. God forbid. Let's say for some reason the normal schedule can't unfold. There's you no such thing. You still have to have a. Must. You must have a Sabbath dinner. Must. Sabbath dinner. Those look fantastic. Okay, put them right there. See, like that looks great. Eh? I like that. Look at that. All the Romans cared about was that the Jews stayed orderly and paid their taxes. But they knew the Jews would not compromise on their sacred laws, which had to be followed. But if they weren't followed, what were the punishments? I'm in Israel, learning all about law and order and crime and punishment in the time of the Bible. In this famous scene from the Gospels, Jesus gets caught between two systems of law and order the Jewish authorities, and the Roman occupiers who eventually passed sentence. Under Jewish law, there was also capital punishment, but the Romans took away the right of the Jewish court to carry it out. Many of the Jewish laws called for the penalty of flogging if they were broken. Why this form of punishment? We know that after his arrest and before his crucifixion, Jesus was flogged on the orders of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. So flogging was both a Roman and a Jewish punishment. But what were the differences? I know I'm going to regret this, but I'm on my way to experience a first century Jewish flogging. Today, prisons serve as both deterrent and punishment. But they weren't so common around here 2,000 years ago. Punishments such as flogging were meant to keep people in line. I'm meeting Rabbi Batsri because he knows flogging. He's even had this flogging device made based on the texts. OK, Rabbi, this looks uh, mean. W what exactly is this? That's, uh, that's like, a, can, I, can I hold this? <laughs> בשביל זה לוקחים אותה קודם כל לרופא, לבדוק כמה מכות מסוגל לאותו אדם לקבל, ולפי זה נותנים לו. אבל עדיף שגם זה לא יהיה, אבל זה קל. This doesn't go on today, right? לא ממשיכים, כי היום אין לנו בית דין, אין לנו סנדרין בבית המקדש, היה סנדרין. אין לנו את כל החוקים של המיטות, או במיטות בית דין. I want to see it in action. Can you give me a good demonstration? אם באמצע יכאב לך, תגיד לא, תפסיק. אין לנו פה רופא. Why don't you do it? Well, I wanted to know what life was like in the first century. So here goes. It's hard not to be serious when you're getting whipped on television. Whoa, wait a minute. That's all you got? I do not get paid enough for this. I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would be in Jerusalem being flogged in a synagogue by rabbis. Never. Never occurred. <laughs> so first century Jewish flogging had remorse and repentance as its goal. It had certain humane elements, but try telling that to my back. The doctor made sure you could take it, and only 39 lashes with this donkey or ox whip were allowed. Roman flogging was a little different. It's believed that the whip used on Jesus had metal ends to tear the flesh, and Rome had no law limiting the amount of lashes not to mention the distinct absence of a doctor. Rome utilized flogging to prolong suffering before crucifixion. But why was this form of capital punishment utilized? I'm meeting New Testament expert Helen Bond to find out. 
how usual or, or commonplace was the idea of crucifixion under Roman law? Crucifixion was fairly common, and the Romans were pretty good at crucifying people. I mean, certainly after major wars and insurrections, there were crosses lining the road for, for a long way. Well, it would have a very sobering effect on the populace, right, to see that kind of, uh, that kind of obvious act of Rome, Roman power. That's right. It's designed to be visual. It's designed to be as humiliating and shameful as possible. With crucifixions, you know, they always keep their loincloth on, but of course, that the person was actually naked. It was deeply humiliating. It, it took a long time for the person to die, and they would have put a, a, a copy of the charge up above the cross so that oh, everybody right. could see, you know, this is what this guy's done, and if you do the same, you'll get the same kind of penalty. The threat of crucifixion seems like the ultimate law and order deterrent, but it was carried out quite a bit. Rome squeezed the populace with heavy taxes, backing up the threat with the ultimate punishment. Just like today, people in biblical times had mixed feelings about paying lots of taxes. It depended where the money was going and if you could tell where the money was going. When King Herod ruled here and did his massive building projects, like expanding the temple in Jerusalem, Jews could see where their tax money was going. King Herod was Jewish, but he was appointed by Rome. Over 2,000 years ago, he built that wall. Herod taxed the population heavily, but he balanced the interests of both cultures. He died around the time Jesus was born, and the period of direct Roman rule by governors such as Pontius Pilate began. The delicate balance was over. I'm heading south from Jerusalem to Herodium, one of the fortresses built by King Herod and where he is buried. Herod built these fortresses because he knew the delicate balance between Jewish and Roman law wouldn't last, and that revolution would come. An incredible fortress, Herodium is built into a hill. It's invisible from the road and has its own water system in case it came under siege. From here, the Roman appointed King of the Jews punished people in the name of Rome. Rome was not only imposing its law and order on the local Jewish population, it also had problems with its own governors, who operated far away from the center of power. To learn more, I'm meeting with Alex Jacobson. He's written about the political system of the Roman Empire. One of the main problems was that beyond what you had to pay Caesar, you had to pay the local officials. Being a governor in a faraway province was a way to get rich for many people. They would just extort and uh, take money, uh, sell uh, judicial decisions, and simply, you know, uh, uh, use riots as pretext for widespread uh, confiscation, robbery, and so rich themselves. It's corruption. It's, basically it's corruption. Cor yeah. Out of sight, out of mind. If you're in a remote yeah. province, that's their retirement plan. That was it? certainly, yeah. That was very often the case. So the central government was interested in preventing excessive oppression and excessive extortion, and understanding that these were the things that would drive people to rebellion. So even if they cooperated with Rome, the Jewish people were still being fleeced by local Roman corruption. And I've heard that when it came to punishment, the Romans were very creative. What other kind of punishments did the, did the Romans impose? Well, crucifixion was the worst, of course. They would, uh, being decapitated was much easier. Sometimes people would be thrown to uh, lions and you know, all kinds of uh, gruesome things. So this is what law and order is like in the Holy Land in the first century. But how did Jews react to the imposition of Roman law? There was a range of reactions, from acceptance to deadly rebellion. Under Roman occupation of first century Israel, the way it was supposed to work was that internal Jewish law would deal with Jewish issues, and Rome would only intervene when there was a threat to peace, quiet, the collection of taxes. But it wasn't so simple because of the holy temple that used to be behind that wall, the Western Wall. The high priest was responsible for maintaining order in the temple, but Rome exerted plenty of influence on him. The high priest's cooperation with Rome led to gray areas of jurisdiction, which affected both the daily life of the temple and the fate of Jesus. But whose law did Jesus break? Some say he committed heresy, which as religious law was a Jewish matter. Some say it was insurrection or sedition, which Rome considered its turf. But if Jesus called himself the Messiah, 
That was a gray area. Was it religious, or did it affect the peace and quiet? By gathering followers and saying the kingdom of God was at hand, Jesus was someone who got everyone's attention. The Romans didn't want anyone talking about any other kingdom than theirs. And anything that threatened the fragile peace worried the priests, who needed the Romans to leave the temple alone so they could keep fulfilling their holy functions. So the high priest had a good reason to cooperate with his Roman occupiers. The priestly class he belonged to was called the Sadducees. They were only one among many Jewish sects, and I'm going to find out about the others and their reactions to Roman law and order. There's all kinds of different groups within first century Judaism, and all with very different ideas of what it means to be Jewish. Mm. So you have um, the, the Sadducees, who are mainly linked with the temple. They're the aristocratic priests. Then you have the Pharisees, and these are ones who, who are very keen to keep the law very strictly. Though debated, some scholars believe Jesus himself was a Pharisee. Then there were the Essenes. This Jewish sect believed in the coming of the kingdom of God, and they wrote about it here in Qumran, by the Dead Sea, and what are some of the oldest documents ever found, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm with author and biblical expert James Tabor to find out more about this Jewish sect and to see the actual place where they hid their scrolls from the Romans. You've heard of Pharisees and Sadducees, right, right. in the Bible? The Essenes aren't mentioned, but they're a radical, apocalyptic group. They're waiting for God to destroy the Romans. And this is where the squirrels were actually found. Take a look. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah. That's a pretty tight fit. James, do people go in here? Well, believe it or not, very few people go in here. It's not a tourist spot, but you're allowed to go in. You should go Can in. I go in? Take a look, get an idea. Okay, the question is, can I actually fit through? Yeah, can you fit? Are you as thin as an Essene? They must have been pretty nimble and pretty uh, pretty tough, I'm thinking. Yeah, the gazelle goat comes to mind. Because it is really rocky and it is dirty. Among the contents of the Dead Sea Scrolls were passages from the Bible. The Essenes, who lived here in seclusion, believed their interpretation of Jewish law was the correct one, to live simply and spiritually, away from others, who, they believed, did not live according to the law. They also wrote about war, describing a battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. Among Jesus' disciples, there may have been Essenes, as well as radicals belonging to other Jewish sects who would end up fighting this war. In Greek, the disciple Simon Zolotis' last name means zealot. The zealots believe that God alone is the ruler of Israel and that the Romans must be expelled. Some say Simon was a member of this nationalist group. And among the zealots were a sect which utilized extreme tactics. They were called the Sicarii, named after the short Roman dagger, the Sica, that they hid in the folds of their robes. They attacked their enemies without warning, then blended back into the crowd. The Gospels tell us that when Jesus is arrested, his disciple Peter pulls out a knife and cuts off the ear of one of the temple guards. We don't know that Peter was a Sicari, but he was handy with a knife. Some scholars say Judas Iscariot was also a member of this group, and his name means Judas the Sicari. Maybe Judas thought Jesus wasn't revolutionary enough. The war of the Zealots against the Romans culminated right here, at the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, with the Jews barricaded inside. And as these people are locked and encased in, in Jerusalem with, with the Romans outside, the Romans come into Jerusalem, they burn down um, the, the, the outer parts of Jerusalem, and the temple itself is burnt to the ground. It's destroyed. And that was a terrible, terrible moment for, for Jews in the first century, and, and still for, for Jews, it's a terrible thing that happened because there are all kinds of different ways of being Jewish in the first century, but the thing that holds everybody together Together is the Jewish law and the temple. And when the temple goes, nobody can understand it. You know, how do you explain that? How did God let the temple be destroyed? These stones were part of the temple wall destroyed by the Romans. So today, you can still see the evidence of that biblical clash between two systems of law and order. 
According to the Gospels, Jesus foresaw the destruction of the temple. Ironically, the sequence of events that followed his arrest may have been partially responsible for the actions that culminated right here. So how did the trial and sentencing of Jesus take place on that fateful Passover? And if you were an average citizen in those times, what message were you being given by the whole process? Well, this is where it all happened. On Passover, Jewish pilgrims from all over the Middle East and beyond would have come right here. They would have walked up these actual steps to the temple. So what was it really like in the first century here? I'm going to meet with Helen Bond, and she'll set the scene. Jews from all over the place are converging in, into what's really quite a small city. It's a huge pilgrimage. People have journeyed long ways. They've, they've come here with their families. They've given up work for a week, two weeks, possibly even more. And there would have been a huge festival atmosphere celebrating, celebrating coming out of Egypt, liberation. During festivals such as Passover, pilgrims to Jerusalem swelled the local population to hundreds of thousands. From a law and order perspective, if I, if I were a, a Roman, uh, <laughs> am I nervous about these kind of gatherings? Very. I think Passover was probably Roman's worst nightmare. Pontius Pilate and the 3,000 Roman soldiers stationed with him at Caesarea also made the trip, just in case there was trouble. It's national liberation from bondage. But the difficulty is that here they are in Jerusalem, and they just need to look up on top of the temple, and they'd see Roman soldiers stationed there. Yeah. Must have struck them as being a huge irony. One of the reasons why the governor comes to Jerusalem, specifically at the Passover, is because it's such a security nightmare. Um, the Jewish author Josephus says that nearly all the, the riots that we know about happened at Passover. Really? So this is sort of a known time for riots, rebellions. But the soldiers are vastly outnumbered by the pilgrims. So what's the Roman strategy? They're fine for a fairly small-scale uprising, but there's always going to be a need to sort of nip things in the bud, you know, to make sure that, that any kind of riot doesn't escalate, because once it escalates, then it's, it's too big for the Roman governor to cope with, and he's got to contact his superiors, and that all looks bad on him, because his, his main duty in the province is to maintain law and order. Where do you cross the line if you're a, a Jew? To bring the Romans in. I think as soon as somebody starts attracting large numbers of people, it's just that uncertainty as to what's going to happen. Romans never liked congregations of people. They were always slightly disturbed by that. If people are stopping doing their, their work and their gathering and there's any potential for a riot, then that's when the, the Romans start to take a notice of what's happening. So kicking over the, the, the money changers' table, is that a violation of Roman law? It was a sign that this was a troublemaker. Um, and, and particularly when he did that with a following, this is a man who you need to watch. And he's doing something provocative, and he might go somewhere else and do something broader scale than that. You know, so it's... nip this in the bud exactly. sort, of, sort of approach to it, and that's where, where Pilate comes in. Well, according to the Gospels, it's the chief priests who, who make the decision that they want to have him arrested, and they're going to pass him over to the Roman governor. Because the chief priests also have had to make sure that law and order was maintained. So the temple guards arrest Jesus and take him to the home of the high priest, Caiaphas. Shimon Gibson and I are now overlooking the valley Jesus crossed when he was taken from the Garden of Gethsemane. This church of St. Peter was built next to a house dated to the first century, and we're heading there now. So here we're going to step back uh, 2,000 years to the first century, and we're going to enter into a house that exists at the time of Jesus and uh, is in the general vicinity of uh, the traditional house of Caiaphas. Step inside. I'll and take what's... off my hat there, out of respect. Yes, that's, that's so this is the real deal. I mean, this is, this is a house from the, the time of Jesus Christ. Exactly. I mean, here you're inside the internal courtyard. You have this depression in which they would uh, place the, the charcoal and uh, be able to have a little uh, fire going. It fits in very well with the story of Peter, who is uh, following Jesus and so uh, who's been taken away by uh, the soldiers and is brought to the house of Caiaphas. And he comes in to the courtyard and he sees the, the soldiers sort of warming their hands uh, at, the fire. Uh, at the fire. So this really sort of serves a good purpose of illustrating uh, the, the point of that story. 
So when they bring Jesus here, where, where do they put him? Now, he's here overnight. So he was probably placed into one of the rock-cut chambers which existed beneath the structure. This was a common practice at that time. This is a subterranean chamber beneath this house from the first century. So it's likely that it would have been in a place such as this, but more likely in a sort of dark uh, cavity such as this one over here. Ah, really? You see, it's really quite dark in here. And uh, so they would have just tossed him back then? Exactly. They would have got rid of him, kept him in there until he was uh, led away for his trial. Jesus is brought before the high priests for questioning, but they soon hand him over to Pontius Pilate who serves as judge and jury. So what was the charge? A couple of the Gospels suggest that blasphemy was the charge, and certainly acting or doing anything against the temple could have been seen as blasphemous because it's such a holy place. Another couple of the Gospels suggest that it was simply the charge of leading people astray or being a false prophet. And those are very broad charges that could be interpreted right. in a number of different ways. But probably they didn't really need a specific charge anyway, because they're intending passing him over to Pilate. Mm -hmm. Clearly, they would have to give Pilate a list of the things that Jesus had done. So were there any other sort of considerations that Pilate would have? Pilate would probably have have spent very little time on the case. I think he would have simply heard from the chief priests what Jesus had been doing, maybe interviewed him himself very briefly, just got some sort of measure of the man, and also get an idea of whether he had to get rid of the followers as well, or whether mm -hmm. just getting rid of Jesus was going to be enough. And I think he would have sent him for crucifixion with barely a second thought. It was nothing like trials today, and the sentence was carried out the next morning. Unlike the stealthy arrest, once the suspect was in custody and the sentence carried out, the punishment was meant to be seen by everyone. Whatever crime Jesus was charged with when he was arrested, the eventual charge nailed to his cross was King of the Jews, suggesting he referred to himself this way, which Rome would see as treason since it appointed kings around here. Before Jesus was born, Rome had given the title King of the Jews to Herod, Shimon and I have now arrived at where Herod's palace was located. It was right behind these walls. The palace was later used by Pontius Pilate when he was in Jerusalem. So are we in the place where Pilate tried and sentenced Jesus? Well, he's led away in the early hours of uh, the Friday morning and brought to the seat of uh, Pontius Pilate. It was situated, uh, archaeologically speaking, behind these walls. And in front of this wall, uh, these remains were uncovered, and uh, there was a gate here. And it must have been a grand spectacle. These walls are massive, and you can imagine the assembly of people here. Based on the archaeological finds here, Shimon has made this drawing of what it would have looked like in the time of Jesus. So here you can see uh, the rocky protuberance in that area, right. and that's situated over there, which is actually referred to in the Gospel of John as Gabata which is a uh, uh, Hebrew word meaning rocky outcrop. And then on the, the right, you had an area of pavement. And this is referred to also in the Gospel of John as the lithostratus, which means in Greek, uh, stone pavement. These two topographical features are referred to in the Gospel of John. So it's, it's probable that this is where Jesus was brought out, right here before the public. Yes. I think this is the place of the trial. So Jesus is imprisoned in the barracks. He is led out into this area here, into this area of, the, of a courtyard. The crowds are able to observe uh, proceedings. And for Pilate, the message is, exactly. I'm in charge, and here's what happens if you defy Roman law. He wants to make a point. He wants to say to those crowds, look, I'm going to be crucifying this guy. I don't want any more problems during the Passover uh, uh, period. And you'll see the cross uh, next to the road leading out of Jerusalem, and you'll know. You'll remember. That you'll remember that I do not want any more uh, uh, disturbances within the city. And this is period. Roman law and order, plain exactly. and simple. And that's how the Romans uh, conducted their business. If you lived here at the time and heard what happened to Jesus, you would have received a pretty strong message about law, order, and the consequences of opposing Rome. Jesus is the one we've heard about, but in the land of Israel under Roman occupation, thousands of Jews were crucified by the empire, which wanted to subdue the citizens into paying a punishing amount of tax. So what was daily life like for the Jews after the crucifixion of Jesus 
and the destruction of the temple. Hundreds of thousands had been either killed or enslaved, but there were still some members of the Zealots and Sakari alive. They were living here, at Masada. Herod had fortified this place to fight potential rebels, but the Jewish rebels defeated the small Roman garrison stationed here. The Jews took over Masada, but in the year 73, the Romans returned with 6,000 soldiers and set up camp to fight the 960 Jewish rebels, the last ones left to defend the Jewish law. I'm with Guy Stiebel, who has excavated here at Masada, and we're walking through what used to be the Roman camp. This is the best preserved uh, Roman siege system in the entire Roman Empire. And if you want an example for the long hand of the law, the Roman law, they went all the way to the middle of the desert. And just imagine that on both sides you'll have tents. You have eight camps all around Masada. And this was a statement. See us, we're here, and it's a sort of a propaganda. We're coming to get you. Exactly. But Masada is not only the place where a battle occurred, it's a place where people lived. Because all communities, rich people, poor people, fled to Masada. So we have clusters of rooms. It's like you can see these different communities. I can identify the areas where women, for example, sat and weave. We found a bakery. We can see lists of various provisions, where the food was stored, who brought the water. So we can speak about life at Masada. Yes, death will come at the end of the day, but I think the stronger thing that you can see here is people fought to live. So how did the 960 Jewish rebels fight back? They had the high ground and could drop huge stones on the Romans. What you see is actually genuine rolling stones. I mean, they're my favorite uh, type of, of weapon, if you wish. This was a Jewish answer for the Roman superiority using the artillery. They just roughly shaped huge stone. You can try and move one. Are these the original yeah, ones? Yeah, you can try to move one and see. You, you need a hand. There's a trick here. No, 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 no trick. Look how heavy they are. Oh, man, that's heavy. But the Romans were building a ramp and a siege tower and constructing a battering ram to break down the wall that separated them from the Jewish zealots. It was four decades after the death of Jesus and the exact same time of year, the festival of Passover. The idea was to bring the siege tower on top of which they have the battering ram. And these are the most important 15 meters. That's all. The entire operation was for, for this place. So, Guy, this must have been a, a, a frightening thing to see, this giant tower coming up this ramp. 2,000 years ago, on the eve of Passover, it was nightmare. The noise, the smoke, the shouts, the crowd, they knew that once they managed to bring these things up, they're doomed. Once the tower was up, and they managed to bridge the wall, then they discovered that the Jews built another wall, secondary wall, made of soil and beams, against which the battering ram is not effective. But you can use torches with fire. When the night came, it went up in flames. What are their options? They're surrounded, right? Are we going to die as free people or by the sword of the Romans? They summon all the men. And what happened is that they decide to commit suicide. There are women and children here, are there not? Mm -hmm. According to Josephus, a lottery was made. It means they draw lots. 10 men were chosen to go through the people and to do the act, and then commit suicide. Just imagine the Romans are breaking into the site. Dead silence. Literally dead silence, and uh, what we hear is that they shout, and suddenly two women and five kids come out of one of the water systems that's scattered around the site, and they told the story about the occurrences of that night. Before the rebels died here at Masada, they lived according to Jewish laws as long as they could. The last vestiges of uprising were over, it wasn't peace, but it was quiet. 
When it came to law and order in first century Judea, on one side there was Roman power, and on the other there were the Jews with their traditions, their laws. One side never had a chance. That side turned out to be the Romans. Their empire, their power did not last, but the Jewish group whose leader was arrested in Gethsemane ended up becoming the biggest religion in the world, with one of its spiritual centers in Rome. As for the rest of the Jewish people, their culture is still here. The temple had been destroyed, but it wasn't the only center of Jewish life. The Torah, the law was and still is.